world gone insane. An upside down civilization cannot be real. A world of madness and terror. It's the Dana Gould Hour. Today's show is brought to you by Keeps. The easiest, most effective way to keep the hair you have. To receive your first month of treatment for free, go to keeps.com slash D-G-H. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash D-G-H. That's a free month of treatment at keeps.com slash D-G-H. Keeps. Hair today, hair tomorrow. We did it! The March episode is here! Just in time for April! But there is so much going on. We have so much time and so little to do. Strike that. Reverse it. In any event, we are here. It is now, and that's all that matters. Our theme this month is fandom. Having your thing and loving it. And we have some amazing guests who talk the talk and walk the walk. John and B. Joe Trimble. For those of you who don't know John and B. Joe, I'm very excited that you get to hear their story for the first time. In the late 1960s, they were fans of a little TV show called Star Trek. And when it was announced during Star Trek's second season that the show would not be returning for a third season, they sprang into action. John and B. Joe knew that TV shows don't go into syndication unless they have three seasons. That gives you enough episodes to strip the show. In other words, you need enough episodes to run five nights a week instead of one night a week without repeating episodes too quickly. You need volume. You need multiple seasons. And two seasons is not enough. In those pre-internet days, John and B. Joe started the letter-writing campaign that literally saved Star Trek. Thanks to John and B. Joe Trimble, Star Trek had three seasons, which allowed it to be syndicated, which allowed it to catch on, find its audience, and become the cultural juggernaut that it is today. We also have Paul Myers, Paul Myers is a smart, funny, exuberant writer, a good friend of mine, and his new book is called The Kids in the Hall, One Dumb Guy. It tells the story of his discovery of the kids in the hall, how they rose to fame in Canada, made the move to the United States, and became, quite literally, the comedic voice of their generation. I strongly believe that. Paul also wrote an amazing book about Todd Rundgren called A Wizard, A True Star, Todd Rundgren in the studio. Paul Myers, John, and B. Joe Trimble. If I could paraphrase the Isley Brothers, they have their thing, and they do what they want to do. As for me, oh good gracious, there's so much going on. First and foremost, if you are a fan of the Dana Gould Hour podcast, and if you aren't, why in the name of Christ are you listening? We are doing a live show here in Los Angeles at Dynasty Typewriter. On April 18th, our guests are Eddie Pepitone, Blaine Kapach, Eliza Skinner, with live music and interviews with Tom Kenny and the High Seas, featuring our own Tom Kenny, Andy Paley, Jalinda Palmer, and Joe Napolitano. It really should be called the Dana Gould Hour Podcast Orchestra, but I'm not going to make this about me. In any event, it's going to be an amazing show at Dynasty Typewriter on April 18th. Ticket and links available at DanaGould.com. Coming up later in the spring, I am doing a tour with the great Bobcat Goldthwaite. The dates are posted at DanaGould.com, but listen closely. Here's where we're going. May 2nd, Zany's Comedy Club in Nashville, Tennessee. May 3rd, The Park West in Chicago, Illinois. May 4th, The Cedar Cultural Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. May 5th, The Crowfoot in Pontiac, Michigan. May 13th and 14th, we will be at the Bell House in Brooklyn, New York. May 15th, the Somerville Theater in Boston, Mass. Actually, Somerville. May 16th, the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. You heard that right, punks. May 18th, the Rams Head on stage in Annapolis, Maryland. May 19th, Underground Arts in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. June 6th, 
the Aladdin Theater in Portland, Oregon, one of my favorite venues, and June 8th, the Marines Memorial Theater in San Francisco, California. And then June 9th, the Gothic Theater in Englewood, Colorado. Each show with special guests and a healthy dollop of very unprofessional fucking around. I promise you. There are more dates coming. There will be a Southern California date. There may be an Atlanta date. But for now, if you live in any of those areas and you're a fan of listening to middle-aged white dudes, could you really do any better? I don't think so. Regardless, as the great Marty DeBerge would say, enough of my yakking. Let's get on to our filthy business. Uh, it's a beautiful day. We're not in Falcon's Lair Recording Studios. We are in the lovely home of Lori and Bob Paz, correct? In sunny Pasadena, California, in a neighborhood I barely found. I you I made the mistake of using ways oh. which will take you through a lake to avoid a stop sign. <laughs> and yes. uh, and I, and then and and as I was on my way here I got a panicky call from my daughter who left her tennis stuff at her mom's house. So I had to I had to do some frantic parenting when I was supposedly on my way here, but it all worked out. Um you know we we're, we're talking about fandom this episode and uh, my, my my other uh, interview uh, is Paul Myers, who uh, is Mike Myers' brother, and Mike wrote um, a book about the kids in the hall. Uh, being a Canadian uh, comedy fan, the kids in the hall were so important to him. And and prior to that, he wrote a book about Todd Rundgren. Uh, and I realized that uh, in in terms of what I view as as modern fandom, and I know that you've been you've been. Uh, uh, awarded this appellation before the, the inventors of what people perceive as uh, as modern fandom. If you are a fan of Star Trek, uh, you uh, uh, in terms certainly of the third season, you have these two people to thank: uh, John and B. Joe Trimble. Would that be? Would I be correct when that I say would that? Be correct. Yeah, that'd be yeah. correct. We're not responsible <laughs> for the content of the third season. <laughs> we just got the show a third season, so it would go into syndication. It is funny when you do when you do watch the original series a lot, and you become a, acquainted with it. You can you can spot a third season show. <laughs> If people right. don't realize no, it. It so. really was a different show. Yeah. My, my understanding of you be, being a, a fan kid, having read David Gerald's book, The World of Star Trek, was that you were fans of the show. And then the word went out that there was not going to be a third season. And you guys started a letter writing campaign that turned that around. But your your involvement with Star Trek goes back much further than that. Actually, before it was aired. Yeah. You uh, you you knew Gene Roddenberry. Yeah. And well, we met Gene at the World Science Fiction Convention in Cleveland in 1966. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Held over Labor Day weekend. And he Star was there. Trek, he was there promoting Star Trek. Right. Because it hadn't even come no. yeah. yet. And he had done something sort of unusual, which was to hire actual science fiction writers whoa what a concept to <laughs> um uh to uh at Write least some of the episodes uh provide the story uh if right. you know if they didn't do script you know have other people did scripts for him but this was such a novel idea that right. that he was kind of embraced by science fiction writers for sure and when, and this just and and people because it was such a different era yes you know, there was science fiction on television at the time, but it was all... Kitty shows. Yeah, it was Lost in Space and Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea and Time Tunnel, which have their own appeal, but it's yeah. not the yeah. same thing. And if you were looking for something serious, the only thing that comes to my mind 
would be you had to go back to the Twilight Zone, yeah. which yeah. was the only thing that, was the only TV show that didn't think you were an idiot. <laughs> Um, yeah, Glenn Larson's yeah. stuff really did think you were. Yeah. Science fiction writers urged Gene to bring uh, an episode. There were several episodes already in the can, of course, and to bring something to this world con where it would be a, literally a choice audience for. Yeah, you go, you know, going right to your uh, your base, yeah. your your political base, right. so to speak. And and Gene brought along three costumes as well, and now. That through the convention because they have, of course, a planned schedule, planned exhibits, and planned. You right, know, and this is a convention in 1966, in which is not yeah. you know conventions now are ubiquitous. Like this San Diego Comic Con is one of the biggest events, right? And and show business and 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 in, in in my life, I've seen the San Diego Comic Con change. As I say now, <laughs> now you go to the San Diego Comic Con to meet people who used to make fun of you for going to the San Diego yeah. Comic Con. <laughs> <laughs> So that true. Is, yeah. That is so yeah. true. And they've actually gotten yeah. the comic books out of it. They've literally pushed the comic books well, out yeah, of the comic con. Well, yeah, it is. It is, basically. <laughs> they're, in a, they're in an adjunct room well, we now. Well, knew, we knew about Comic Con back when it was in the El Cortez Hotel. Wow. And uh, in the, the the basement meeting rooms. Sure. And, and they, and like, they, like a communist cell. Yeah, and they all fit down there. <laughs> Subterranean, literally. And, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everybody has their prized parts of their collections mm -hmm. you know um what is the, your are is that yours you when you go in that when you go very in the much, house very much so yeah. yeah we don't really have a big collection of anything and specifically star trek stuff i have um uh, a a million dollar gold press latinum brick Million credit, honey. Million credit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Million yeah. Million. And, um, and I, I almost said million quatlu. Um, <laughs> another show. Another it could have been. I mean, yeah, it could have been. But uh, it's, it's huge. It's a brick about this big, of course, yeah. colored gold. And it was given to me by um, – one of the people when they were clearing clearing the set for the last time, and frankly, Amazing. everything that was there, uh, Paramount made everybody throw away. Yeah, that, that just went in the dumpster. And tons and tons and tons of really yeah. of valuable stuff. They they could have put an entire burn unit in Children's Hospital with uh -huh. the amount of money they'd have made. Just I'm sure. selling the nails off of the yeah. set, you know, it just insane and just made me so angry so actually um uh if you walk walked across the lot with me back in those days you became a proficient dumpster diver right and this is the the paramount lot on melrose paramount yeah. lot. right and we'd, we'd have people walk by and say you can't do that and i say we know yeah yeah we know about it. <laughs> well i well now you you met uh, speaking of fandom mm -hmm. and and this is gonna you met at the home of forrest ackerman Correct. John and I did. Well, yeah. right. Yeah, we we, we actually, you two. Yeah, we'd actually sort of passed in the night, um, uh, and and you know, was high I mean, fellow fan high, you know. Right. But we hadn't focused in on each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, at this party, our dear friend Forrest G. Ackerman. Yeah, and we, we've he, spoke just a little biographical yeah. for the people who are uninitiated. Although we we've talked about Forrest Ackerman a lot yeah. on this podcast. Oh well, then you what, know the original the, the original fan, the original, the fan. king of fans, uh, the editor of uh, Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine. Right. If you don't know what that is. Go, go listen to a just, yeah. go listen to another podcast. <laughs> uh, and uh, and Forrest had this home in Griffith Park. And you could call him. His number was listed. It was two one three Moon Fan, and you could call yes. him up and say, uh, "I want to come and see your collection." And you go, like, "Well, we're having an open house next Sunday. Come on by." And when I moved to Los Angeles in yeah. nineteen eighty nine, and I had been collecting famous monsters since I got, the, I think I got my first issue in nineteen seventy four. Um, uh, and I, you know, it was just like everybody else. And I came and I called Moon Fan and got the voicemail and, and yeah. left a message and they called back. And, and I went there and I was just agog. Yeah. Um, well, the original house that he, he had developed in, in Los Angeles, anyway, was down on uh, Sherborne over in. Uh, just outside yeah. of Beverly Hills. Just and, outside. Of, oh, okay. So I went to the Griffith and, Park. Yeah. One. yeah but yeah. this house, it would have been the same thing in, in the Griffith Park house. When he, he would, he loved to throw parties for his birthday. And his birthday was over Thanksgiving weekend. He also did not get chairs. 
Okay. I mean, whatever chairs he had in the house, those were the chairs. Right. And so you had no place to sit down. Uh, if you if you tried just sitting on the floor, somebody stepped on you. Right. So and you could also be sitting next to the original dinosaur from King Kong or something, something like that. You had to be yeah. very careful at Forrest so, House. So we grabbed uh, actually some other fan really grabbed some chips and dip and crawled under the piano. So when a fan would come by, and he would say, "Hey, come on down." We'd, and so eventually. Uh, several of us ended up under the piano. By this time, we're kind of crisscrossing legs to fit yeah. under. And then, John, and what, what, what year is this? Oh, God. <laughs> 1959, I think. Okay. 58 or 59. Okay. Yeah. Because, and so, so John comes in. Now, he's come in from. Now, has, has Famous Monsters been published yet? Oh, yeah. no. No, not yet. No, it was early. It was like 62, wasn't it? Yeah, before. before, Okay. uh, So you knew about him before the magazine. Oh, Oh, yeah. We had met him ages ago. Okay. Um, We're all under the piano. And (laughs) John comes in. I knew at least three of the other people that were under the piano. Uh Uh-huh. So one of them said, hey, Trimble, you know, we're down here. So Uh I crawled under the piano as well and wound up sitting next to B. Joe and... And <laughs> we ended up not talking about fandom, but exchanging stupid officer stories because I, you're both I in had the just service. been in the, in the service. You're both in the service, yeah. yes. You're not like these little no. You're like these old nerd kids. You're vet. You're veterans. Right. You're well, big strapping well, Navy Air Force veterans. <laughs> I don't about big and scrapping, but but I was a nerd before I went in, and I was a nerd yeah. when I came out. So no, there was no. Yeah. Bob Burns know. was also a nerd in the service. Yes, I mean. yes. That's a whole book, nerds yeah. in the service. Oh, you know, you can. You can <laughs> That. Yeah, when uh, I was walking through the barracks one time and there was this bull session going on in a portion of it, somebody looks up and says, hey, Trimble, you read. <laughs> and they wanted me to solve Come something. referee something. Yeah, that Can was you it. prove this is a book? We're introducing uh, the author of among uh, other among other books, uh, <laughs> the kids in the hall, one dumb guy, now out in in paperback, I believe it is, and also uh, an excellent book that I'm going to grill him on, uh, a wizard, a true star, Todd Rundgren in the studio. Why? Thank you, thank you for uh, mentioning that. Yeah, well, I just heard a long interview with Andy Partridge, so we're going to nerd out a little on on Todd Rundgren. Oh, yeah, well, um, especially if you've just heard Andy Parker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. They Sounds like they got along great. Famously. Uh, famously. Um, yeah, but but first and foremost, I should introduce you, Paul Myers. Hi. You, gentlemen. Hi. Uh, I'm, I'm here uh, in Falcon's Lair Recording Studio above the beautiful Mulholland Drive view shelf. You're in uh, Berkeley, California. Are you in Berkeley or yeah? Well, just 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 above Berkeley, but we you know it's a secret location. But it's 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 uh, it's actually the town of Kensington. But don't go looking for me. You know, it's it's just above Berkeley. It's literally just above Berkeley. Kensington is also a grotesquely Myers centric name. (laughs) Yeah, it sounds it sounds like it it sounds like a place that you would that you would live in. Well, it's, it's a funny little, because it's a little it's, it's a little British. Although I know you're Canadian, it's a little British. no. We're British Canadian. Your mom's British. Yeah, yeah. Your yeah, mom's yeah. British. And my dad. Uh huh. And also, there's a Kensington Market in Toronto where I grew up, right? So, so that's the interesting thing. We go to a Sunday market here called Kensington Market, and I I told somebody at in Toronto that I was at Kensington Market, and they were like, "I didn't know you were back in Toronto, eh?" You know, it's like you know, because that's how everybody <laughs> talks. Um, but anyway, yeah, no, and yeah, no, I believe, you know, to cut to the chase, my brother also has a character named Mrs. Kensington in the first Austin Powers film. So yeah, yeah, exactly. So there um, you go. I mean, if you weren't going to say it, we should say, yeah, well, your brother, your brother is Mike Myers, but that's true. Well, that's, write, yeah. I mean, but that, he didn't write a book on Todd Rundgren. You did. I did. I did. I did. In fact, in fact, I'm really proud of that book because it was probably one of the first things I ever, um, I, it's my third book, but it was the first time I'd ever just sort of thought of an idea and went to a publisher and said, Hey, do you guys want to do this? And it's like going to be me talking to Todd Rundgren about every record he ever produced. And then I'm going to talk to the artists he produced and get their side of the story. And then I'm going to make it into a, a narrative where it looks like they're all in the same room talking. And they, they went, Oh, okay. You know, so I got wow. that. Book. It was, I'm very proud of and musicians and, uh, audio people, right. You know, recording engineers and such, 
constantly tell me how much they love that book, which is really yeah. gratifying because it's such a niche market. It is a niche. It is a niche market, but it's also it's the kind of, it's the you know I and I know I'm musically illiterate. Um, I can't play an I can't play a drum. Um, but uh, I what I love about that world is it's like my world, only different. It, you know, it's, I know what you mean. Uh, I know, yeah, yeah. So I, I can enjoy it from uh, I can enjoy it from that perspective. And all comedians want to be rock stars. So and inversely, you, all musicians inversely, want to be comedians. And you, if you've is, ever seen me on Twitter, really true. if you ever see me embarrass myself on Twitter, you know <laughs> that all musicians try really hard to be funny. And I'm, I know, I'm pulling off yeah, that. I'm pulling. I off. know many that I know many that really want to be comedians. Yes. Yeah, um, I mean, I like to, and many, th- are, I, and I, many are hilarious. I like many to are, think, many are I, hilarious. in my defense, I like to think that since I'm around comedy so much, I've grown up around comedy. I'm a huge comedy nerd. I like to think that I only show people the stuff that I think is sort of funny, like you know, like I. I but I also don't. I know the "don't try this at home" theory as well. Like you know, you. It's <laughs> like you know, like it's yeah. I mean. I mean, yeah, well, you know, it's like it's like all the uh, all the comedians that uh, want to be rock stars. <laughs> Absolutely, I mean, you know, I mean, I think Mark Maron's turning out to be a really great guitar player. But when he first started talking about it, I was thinking, oh, here we go. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> yeah. And it, obviously, he's worked at it, so that's great. But yeah, uh, yeah but I he, mean, it happens. And he looks like John Sebastian. He well, has they, a little bit of John Sebastian. There you go. And, and yeah, I'm trying to think of a love and spoonful joke, but I'm sure the '80s were, were not kind to any of them. Um, <laughs> no. But but, um, but anyway, yeah, so I wrote this book about Todd Rundgren, and I'm really, really touched that you mentioned it, because I know we're here to talk about the kids in the hall, but I absolutely yeah. welcome talking about music anytime. Well, let, well, well, let, well, let's get to, like, when you said it's a book, it's an idea you came up with. You grew up in Canada. You, you, your brother is Mike Myers. Yes. Um, how did, uh, you know, did you sort of, because I, I, I often find... In like sort of the monster nerd world, <laughs> monster movie nerd world, right, which right, I'm right, more right. Verse, versant in, um, you know, there's the, everybody reads famous monsters and loves horror movies, and then they get to be 13, yeah. and some kids pick up a guitar and become cool, and they go into heavy metal, <laughs> and the other kids just stay fat and nerdy and become me. Um did you and Mike have that similar thing where y- you were into music and he was into comedy and you were into comedy and he was into music? Uh, and well, then at one point you split. Yeah. Well, here's what it's like. There's actually three of us. Uh, there's Peter Myers, who's the older, older Myers. And he, he was into, you know, we kind of had a thing. We're all about a year and a half apart in age. I'm the middle kid. And mm-hmm. we had this thing where, you know, we had a built in quorum to watch comedy on TV as well as get into music. So Peter brought home, um, Peter brought home the first uh, Led Zeppelin, not the first Led, the first Led Zeppelin records in our house. Right. Uh, and then, uh, he also brought in the first Elvis Costello, the first Talking Heads, and the first XTC, interestingly wow. enough. And, and, See, he had good taste. Yes, he did. And he also used my to. Bro- my brothers brought yeah. home the Charlie Daniels band <laughs> that, uh, the out, the outlaws. And oh, I grew up yeah. in Massachusetts. I grew up in Massachusetts, but, but this is what the this I, we have the Steve Miller band album where he's wearing the Spider Man mask on the cover. Oh yeah, the Joker. We didn't. Yeah, yeah I yeah. didn't get into good music until I went to college. Well, that's that's interesting. Yeah, because it's sort of like uh, I had the other thing. I had the sort of the Cameron Crow thing where the older sibling had the great records and you would sort of inherit them. And then we I, I inherited the I inherited the comedy albums that ah. that that clicked that that was on that was on fleek. I think the kids still say oh, that. Fleek, I don't they know. They totally say that in 1995. But um, yeah. uh, so, so the interesting. <laughs> by the way, I've never Gro- I've never done groovy? that. Is I, it groovy? It's groovy. It's hep. It's what the kids are dancing to at the discotheque. <laughs> um, but uh, but you, okay. So I should. Uh, you just reminded me of something though. That my it was my father who brought us the comedy. My father was the one he's an englishman from liverpool he never never quite adjusted to being canadian my mother did my mother wanted to become a citizen but my dad was like i'm british you know and uh yeah. this bloody country that i won't re- that I, I moved to and chose to be in <laughs> and uh, but he would watch of course and my brother mike's talked about this in his interviews but he would watch python on uh, i think it was on cbc first in canada and then later we'd see it on pbs from buffalo new york but uh 
um, he would like let us stay up to watch Python because it was British. And it was like, you got to check this out. And you know, at the same time, my parents being from Liverpool, they were also super into the Beatles, even though I'm not sure they were the right age demographic, as the kids say. Uh, right. As the scientists were they too, say. Were they too old or too young? Or? I think they were just a little too old for the Beatles. Just even a little then. Too, yeah, my, yeah. How old are your, my parents, how old are your parents Well, now? my parents, well, they're both deceased, but they would have been... 90 my brother yeah, okay. died my brother died last year at 92 so okay yeah they're just so yeah well yeah. My, my apologies but 92 is oh no 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 run. yeah no no i um, thought they had lots of life in them dana and i'm completely yeah. no um <laughs> <laughs> i can't believe you're saying this it's no no giant, it's true and my, well my dad did pass away prematurely not to get into a bummer rap but uh in the he died in the 90s like he died in 92 of alzheimer's disease which uh oh, which was tragic. kind of a drag i mean there there was yeah. no way around that because i'm i think i'm I'm just about the age my dad had Alzheimer's. So, oh no! Like, I, so, yeah. yeah, no. I my parents are still alive. They're in their 80s, and um, my my mom has uh, got some Alzheimer's-like symptoms. Oh, yeah, and uh, yeah, and it, and it is weird. And I am now well past the age that I remember my dad being at. Like I have yeah, memories of yeah. my dad where I'm older than he is now. Uh, I you know, think, older, yeah. Where I'm older now than he was at the time. I always think about that with Sean Lennon. Sean Lennon is what forty six now or something. Or... Yeah, he's older than his dad ever was. Oh God, that's a. I mean, uh, anyway, but I digress. We've moved into a whole digression. My dad brought the. Comedy. I always thinking about. I always think about Julian Lennon, where the only thing he remembers his dad saying is, "How about that, Sean?" <laughs> Oh my god! And then they're, they're buddies now, though. So like they, yeah. They, well, it's not they, Sean's fault. <laughs> exactly. Well, Sean and Sean and Julian see each other as the you know because they both look like John, and and they. It's they, so funny. They look like John, but they don't look like each other. Yeah, I guess that's the Yoko gene. You know? Much in the same way, Charlie Sheen and Emilio Estevez yes. both look like Martin Sheen, but they don't look like each other. That's yeah. They're like a, a Venn diagram family. Yeah. <laughs> Um, perfect, sort of. Per- is it? perfect. Yeah. No, as I get kids, it totally. Yeah. As the kids say. Um, as the kids say. You know, so, so my dad would bring. <laughs> my, my dad would also talk about the Goon Show, and he had heard them right. in Britain. So whenever they came on the radio, and CBC would play them on the radio in the car, and say, "Oh, turn this up. It's uh, Spike uh, Milligan." And like, I'm like, "Oh, Spike Milligan. What's that?" And we knew all these names, like Michael Benteen and Morecambe and Wise, and we knew all these English comedy things. Like, we didn't know how we knew them, kind of. And then right. some of that stuff came on TV eventually in reruns. And, and then the goodies came on, which was the after goodies. Python. After Python, I, I think goodies. everybody, because they were sort of affiliates of Python, right? Tim Brooke Taylor. Yeah, you had really great, but really great taste in comedy and really great exposure to comedy. Yeah, I did. I, had uh, a lot, I mean, that's the thing. When I was a kid, I remember the three things I remember most wanting to be was either in the Beatles uh, later and later in Led Zeppelin or Monty Python, like those were the three super rock groups of my day. Right. You know? Well, and, yeah. there is that theory that there is that theory that George Harrison believed that there was like a special kind of magic that the Beatles had, and then when it left the Beatles, it went into Monty Python. Well, that's you know certainly something George Harrison would say, and I think <laughs> yeah. I think it's actually probably true. Uh, yeah. And it's hard to say though because you know if you're a scientist, you'd probably think, well, the Beatles exposed, well, the the Pythons were exposed to Beatles, so right. So there, there's yeah. no this. It's almost like more than just a gen uh, than a spiritual. And it is thing. true because and the and the Pythons were really. The Pythons inherited the comedic spirit of the Goon Show, which was yeah. Peter Sellers and Spike Milligan. Right. A uh, very fa- for those of you who don't know, very, very, very famous uh, stage and radio show in Britain in the fifties and sixties, and their producer was George Martin, right. who then produced the Beatles. So there is yeah, a yeah. weird, a, a literal, a li- literal genetic uh, link. But the, so so. Python is very important to you as a kid. Yeah. It's sort of like a, and as it was to me, it was like a flag. It was like a show that said, and I got to do it really young because of my next door neighbor and my childhood friend, uh, Alan Anderson, who got me into it in like 73, four, wow, that's crazy, nine, yeah. nine or 10 years old. And he's a little bit older than I am, uh, still is. And, but it was like a flag. It was a show that said, no, no, I know you're not an idiot. I get you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I no. get you. So, and there were a couple, and that's so important. And the other shows like that, for me, were Twilight Zone and Star Trek. 
It's like, and and then and then Saturday Night Live. It's like, no, no, I get you. I know you're smart. Uh, you're not a dummy. Well, no, that's true. And it's it. funny you mentioned that because that's also part of the story of uh, like me and my brother Peter and my brother Mike is we we had each other to discuss these things, which is super important. I'm realizing later, like you know what I mean, like just totally. that we had a built in. We thought everybody had two other guys to talk about this stuff, with, <laughs> you know, and and we'd have like um a kind of a we Peter referred to it once as the research and development department because somebody would come up with a joke and then the other person in the room would it's like a writer's room somebody in the writer somebody in the room would say uh you know you'd say is it christmas or is it tuesday and then and the, and then we'd sort of giggle at this dumb joke and peter would say i think it's funny if you say thursday and, uh, and, and <laughs> yeah no that is exactly a writer's room and and but then but then we realized we, we got so scientific that we go it's tuesday if you're an american comic from brooklyn it's thursday if you're british because the way they say it like it's tuesday is it christmas no yeah. it's tuesday and it, is it christmas <laughs> no it's thursday you know that's funny when no, you you're, say you're absolutely right but, you know, I, here's the thing i'm not being smug i know i'm right because we we hammered this stuff out for like 25 sure. years no i mean i don't even know like past long past the point of living at home we were talking about this stuff in fact even now i think when my when my my mother passed away last year as i said peter was there taking care of her and peter you know called me the night it happened and you mm. think in this emotional moment we suddenly went, hey, have you seen Letter Kenny? Like, we're starting to talk about these shows that are on TV. <laughs> and because, in a weird way, why uh, no, not? That that why happens. not? Like, with the, sure. you know, like, I mean, like, when my father passed away, I called my brother. He was on SNL at the time. And I said, okay, it happened. He's He's gone. And, you know, we'll see, come back on the weekend. And, and he said, uh, he, he said, oh, good for him. And yeah, me too, because he had Alzheimer's. So we were like, oh, good for him. We just started laughing our heads off. And it wasn't the bad kind of laughing. It was the no, kind I of, understand completely. It, yeah. it was just, and I just thought, you know, humor will see you through. So don't, so when we talk about musicians wanting to be comedians and comedians wanting to be musicians, there's both of those things are like the stuff of life, you know, like, like I really believe that a great song. And yeah, I've heard you talk about you when we were talking about the kids in the hall and you mentioned the, that they were like the replacements or the, um, right. Or I can't remember. You said REM. It's a long time ago, but, uh, we were sitting in the cafe, uh, deli in, uh, Berkeley and Berkeley. Yeah. But, but I remember, I remember being, I was totally excited by that. And you were referring to, uh, some shows being like pet sounds versus other shows being, you know, like, like the influence yeah. to other musicians, you know, Mm -hmm. And that is all, that's where I live, man. And this is why I'm so excited that I got to write a book about the kids in the hall. I'm not segueing, by the way, uh, necessarily. No, well, I, cause you're, cause I had the segue. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I yeah. had the segue ready, which was, uh, as we were talking about how important Monty Python was to you as a kid and how it sort of pointed you along the way, I was talking to uh, Cliff Nesteroff. Oh, yeah. Uh, who also said, like, for him, it was the kids in the hall. Like, the minute he got the kids in the hall, it was like, oh, oh, I'm not alone. Right, right. They said, you know, which is better, Christians or Jews? <laughs> I said, uh, I can't really tell you about that. I'm, uh, I'm an agnostic. Mm -hmm. Well, what's that? I said, um, I'm a follower of the great god Agnos. <laughs> Not Spiro and, Agnos. <laughs> and they said, well, what's that? You know, and I said, well, it's a, it's a religion. I said, you know. You do. I said, now, there's not any churches or anything like that, and there's no specific priesthood or anything like right. that. I said, you just believe, and Agnos knows it. That's, per that's, that's the best one I've heard so far. <laughs> they, don't, they don't try to get any offerings out of you or anything? Yep. They're actually they actually behave in a Christian manner, so they they have no, they have no place they have no place in religion. Yeah, um, yeah. really. That's so funny. Yeah, and again, it's important. Like this is the this is the fifties. This was back before right. all that. Even that level of cynicism wasn't like widely no no. Yeah, it was it was, it was especially such not a different in the service. Time. In the service, yeah, it was such it was such a very different time. The service had only just been integrated, I believe. It was integrated in forty eight. Yeah, nineteen forty seven. Forty seven. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, by just, uh, Truman. You know, yeah, yeah, women women were still an unusual thing, really. Right. You know, and and how did you end up joining the Navy? This is uh, I did it to avoid marrying the first stupid male I ran across because my family did that. I mean, my family were mostly uh, oaky crop pickers. Uh huh. And, and um, you migrated to California. Migrated to California out of the dust bowl. The street, yeah, found out the streets weren't paved with gold, and mm -hmm. even if they had been, they wouldn't let us pick it up. Right. And um, so. Um, 
basically, um, you know, it's like you're 18 and you're not married and have four kids. What's wrong with you? Right. So basically it was to get away from that. And mm-hmm. I joined the Navy and it didn't take very long for me to have a serious accident, a uh, physical accident. Oh. And um, it turned out they were – it was going to be easier to um, invite me to go away than it was to uh, deal with it in those days. Right. And so um, – I took an honorable and um, and uh, left. How and, long are you uh, in the Navy for? A year and a half. That's it. You did basic. Uh, did basic and did um, did a stint at USNTC Great Lakes. Uh-huh. And, and you um, grew up out here. I grew up out here. In, yeah. in a little place called Thousand Oaks, California. Well, that Or as was, I call it, yeah, God's country. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that is sure pretty car- area. But uh, uh, that was, um, oh, I did, we didn't move there until I was a about um, first year of no last last year two years of um, of grammar school mm-hmm. they didn't have out of Oklahoma you know no actually um, uh, at that point from Mountain View uh, oh, sure. and um, but that's where they went for war jobs see this is the only time this is the first time Okies made any real money right was during the war because uh, most of them couldn't pass a military physical. Because of malnutrition? And- uh, malnutrition, um, uh, stoop labor, uh, uh-huh. various kinds of things that, uh, you know, uh, uh, happen to, to, to them physically out in the fields and so on. And um, so they, however, at, could be at home and get war jobs. Which paid enormous money amount of money compared to what to them, they yeah. Ever made. Th- that's so funny that you mentioned this. a thing that people don't think about is the 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 physical effects of poverty and how they oh. are generational. This is apropos of nothing, and it's it's name droppy, but um, <laughs> through a situation of circumstances, I ended up having a conversation with Roger Daltrey, oh, um, sure. and he was saying that his, his He's short. He's he's shorter than I am. I'm mm-hmm. I'm um and I'm two foot eleven. Um <laughs> no, I'm like five eight, five nine, and, and he's about my height, maybe a little bit shorter. And he mm-hmm. said that he has very short legs because he was a kid during World War Two in Britain and they they had powdered milk that was mostly yeah. chalk. Yeah. Severe rationing. Yeah, yeah, severe and and not a lot of calcium. Yeah. And so the they literally just stunted Stunted bone growth because of rationing during World War II. And that in, could be a nicer yeah, guy, by the way, Roger. Yeah. And really, okay. Yeah. Then in that we were very lucky because, of course, uh, most of our work would be done on farms and so on. Right. So we did get milk, just not a lot of protein. And, and another story that's also name droppy. <laughs> um, uh, Mel Brooks was telling me that when he first came to California in the fifties, you know, he grew up in Brooklyn. And he remember calling his brother saying, like, you if you can just walk down the street and pick an orange. Like, and he was like, <laughs> but to them, it was like, you'll never go hungry. Yeah. You can yeah. always grab a couple of oranges just walking down the street. It was yeah. it was it was yeah. mind boggling. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah. was mind boggling. And, and, and mostly, I mean, we lived in a camp out um, in Blythe, outside of Blythe and uh, dirt floor tent. And, uh, well, there wasn't much use in putting a floor in it because the wind was blowing all the time. You'd end up in sand anyway. Right. Everybody knew how to make something out of something. Mm -hmm. And when they, like a big pickup truck would pull into the camp, I still remember this even as a small child. And some of the men would pile into it and they'd go out and they would help uh, uh, kill and uh, uh, dress out animals. Right, like a deer or something. They would take buckets with them because they were going to be bringing back all of the innards. Sure. And, you know. The succulent innards. Yeah. uh, Well, uh, yeah, as a matter of fact. Well, uh, you eat (laughs) them. The sweetbreads, isn't it? You eat them. Sweetbreads, the the lungs, the liver, the, you know, the whole works. Um, That that is a very, that's that's the definition of misnomer. Sweetbreads. It's yeah, not, yeah, it's yeah, neither, not so it's much. It's neither sweet nor is it bread. No, no. So you <laughs> my know, friend, my friend George Meyer had a really funny observation about country crock margarine. Mm-hmm. Not made in the country doesn't come in a crock. No. <laughs> Two words 
two lies. <laughs> yeah. That's advertising. Just, just, go, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just going in, right? So, yeah, but, um, but it, it meant that when they brought it all back, you had a whole bunch of things that the women in the camp, because we were sharing the camp with the Braceros, Right, coming across the border on a green core a card, bless their hearts, working their their rear ends off, right, and then taking the money home, right. They got to do that. They could come back the next uh, picking season. It was stopped because Americans were running around saying, "Here are all these dirty Mexicans taking jobs away from us." Fine, you want to do stoop labor in the strawberry fields? Yeah. Come on out, right? But you know, and and of course, none of them did. No, <laughs> yeah, none of them did. so. Yeah. Um, That's what I always say. Yeah. You know, and, who, 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 what angry person here demanding a wall wants to go pick lettuce for 75 cents a day? Go, exactly. Go, line up over there. Yeah. Well, no. What we'll do is end up buying it from Mexico and Chile anyway. Yeah. So you know, <laughs> kind of a vicious circle. Yeah. Well, it, the, but, the yeah. whole – yeah, you can, you can sum up. Everything that's going on now with H.L. Mencken's quote, for every complex problem, there's a solution that's simple, easy, and wrong. No, I get yeah, that. And, yeah, and especially in Canada, I know that it's just so incredibly important. Yeah, like the, um, the first one in Canada for us was SCTV because we we realized right. that SCTV, and you know, we knew that Second City had been the proving ground where uh, at least Dan Aykroyd and I think Gilda Radner, and and then when SCTV came on the air, we suddenly learned about Joe Flaherty and all those people and Gene Levy and and um, and Andrea Martin and Catherine O'Hara, you know, and they became. Not only were they great the way SNL was great to us, they were great and they were they were shooting it in Toronto and then Edmonton, but you know, they were mainly shooting it near us and they kinda talk like us. And that was huge. Yeah. You know, the whole thing about representing when people talk about that in cultures. It's like, wow, like, you know, Canadian like me. You know, like it was it was, it was huge. <laughs> yeah, it was I, huge. I, I totally get that. And then the kids in the hall were the next one because they were not only were that they were our age, you know. So the kids in the hall were like our friends, you know. And we'd uh, in my yeah. case, I'd watch them. I'd watch them from the same rock band scene that I was playing music in. So it was like, it wasn't just that they were my age. They were kind of my peers, you know? Yeah, totally. It's like, I mean, uh, I was just listening to, uh, 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 this is an old example, but the way the, the, the way the mods felt about the who it's like, yeah, you're my band. Yes, you're my group. Absolutely. And we're you, interchangeable. I am on, you know, you could be standing next to me in the audience watching you. We're the same person. And, and that's so, that's so important. It's so important when, especially when you're coming of age and you're just, you know, you're in your late teens and your twenties and you're figuring out who you are. You're assembling your personality like a, like a kit. And, uh, you know, you find these a show, a band, a group that 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 speaks to you and helps you form that. It's it's so crucial. And I and I I know when, I knew in uh, in America in high school uh, we would get SCTV. It was called SCTV Network, right? And it was on. I believe it was on. It was either on after SNL or on Fridays. I'm not I think positive. It, I think it was on Friday, and I, and I think yeah. some affiliates put it on after SNL. Or, yeah. at one, yeah. one o'clock. But I yeah. knew it was better than SNL. It, I mean, yeah, like, arguably, yeah. certainly, certainly by the time SCTV was, it was rolling, it was yeah, definitely, it was really, yeah. it was denser. It was denser. There was a higher density to it. Also, by then, and, I, I would, uh, I would assume that by then you also were a bit of an esteem about comedy to the point where you recognized the uh, craftsmanship that went in. Yes, in in high school, and and it's just, and I knew this in high school with with nobody to talk about it with except my uh, my friend uh, across the street, uh, Alan Anderson, who I've mentioned already. He was the only person that I could like, did you see that? That was crazy. Um, yeah. I remember, I remember a, a Rick Moranis bit. It was George Carlin's modern relationship. <laughs> and it was, and it was a parody of Albert Brooks's modern romance. Yes. I mean, go, go starring right. George Carlin. Oh. As Rick Moranis as George Carlin. That's right. And I, and I remember thinking, because I uh, worship George Carlin. Yes, as we all did. I remember thinking, these guys are doing are, are making fun of George Carlin in that other guy's movie. Yeah, it was, and it was, 
it was crazy to me. Oh no! And yeah. I would I would watch SNL with my brothers, and I would watch them laugh at like the other stuff. Like we would laugh at different things, and that's when I knew, like, oh yeah, I'm hearing a different, I'm hearing a totally different tone. No, no, it's true. And you, you mentioned Rick Moranis because he was like the late comer to SCTV. He was the only one who wasn't. Uh, he wasn't really from the stage, uh, Second City stage, the way the others were. And he brought the he brought he brought like a radio rock and roll sensibility. He, you know, Jerry Todd was yeah. so about technology, and it was so about uh, cutting edge video, video, video. video. Yeah, and this also you know, like gleefully bringing in all this stuff. Like, I'm just going to throw it through the Rastercom 3000 or whatever it was. You know? <laughs> just going to slide those faders up now. We're going to take you to the plasmatics. You know, like the- that's right. That's right. You know, every generation from World War One on has a dark helmet, and he's ours. <laughs> That's true. No, that's, and, and the thing is, Rick did bring the rock and roll back. He brought a little bit of that. Like they had, like the, the I think the well, recess, yeah, well, they did the bit of the, the recess the, monkeys, did, right? Wasn't that his thing? The, also, the the lead singer of the Doobie Brothers. Oh the, yes, of course, yes, Michael McDonald. Well, they, yeah, they, they did a, they did a, a bit about such Michael a McDonald. Long, such a long way to go. You know, like just <gasps> such a long way to go. So there's okay, there's this guy like Rick Rick Moranis who's who hears this record on the radio and just like I would, he's thinking, "Wow, Michael McDonald sits out throughout this entire tune, but comes in for that one line." <laughs> And like, and then you just just to take the extremism of him driving across town and then signing the release forms afterwards, right? He signs the, the AFM contract, <laughs> and and this was like seventy nine eighty. Oh yeah, that's so cool. And, yeah, no, that's and, the yeah. stuff right there, man. But like, I remember like watching, but I remember watching that on SCTV Network, and you know, I I knew enough about what was going on, and and I thought it was hilarious, and it was just crazy in the specificity of it. Yes. And no one else got it. But it didn't insult. It didn't with, insult your intelligence. Like, you know, it like no, it, 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 like, no, it like let you come to it. it. Actually, right. Not only did it not insult your intelligence, it assumed you were smart. Yes. You know, yes. Like, yeah, you'll get this. And that's and that's this. how you ended up at the Simpsons, right? I mean, that's probably the same part of your brain, right? Yeah, totally, totally. The the one that can. I mean, like the the people the. The yeah the the thing that can you can separate like like I as I said I'm musically totally illiterate but in comedy I can separate all the instruments oh yeah I yeah can, yeah you know it's, the reason I don't really watch a lot of comedy for enjoyment is it's I don't enjoy it I just break it down no I, automatically I, I know just exactly break what you down. mean because and you yeah. know that you know that you talk to musicians probably me too that. I'll listen to pet sounds and I'll be able to hear, isn't that neat that he has like a bass harmonica and all of a sudden a harp plays for three notes and then Hal Blaine hits a snare and, yeah. and I can God, totally, God hear, rest his soul. Yeah. God rest his soul. I mean, um, yeah. he's gone to the great rim shot in the sky. Yes. Um, I was listening. I was listening to an interview yesterday with, I forget his name, but he was one of the old Motown guitarists. And, um, and he was saying like, he'll be listening to the radio and he'll just go, what the hell? They have two drum. They have two drum kits going. Yeah, yeah. Like he'll, he'll, like he can hear that somebody's on the, somebody's on like the tom toms and the snare, and at the same time on the hi hats. Like, yeah. No, they, they can't do that at the same time. They have two kits. They also had a full oh, full time tambourine player in that band. Yeah. <laughs> yes. no, no, seriously, a guy who just hit and he hit him with drumsticks. Sometimes you know you could hear like kah, 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 downbeat tambourines. You know, like yeah, yeah I know. Uh, you know, hey, oh, by the way, just on a tangent, because this is my life, but uh, I always, it always killed me that the bass player on most of the Motown records was James Jamerson, and the drummer he drummed with a lot, he played with a lot, was Benny Benjamin. <laughs> like they, oh, It was hilarious. almost like those are the names they gave the cops. You know, like, <laughs> just tell me your name's James uh, Jamerson, and you're yeah. Benny Benjamin. <laughs> Like, Joe, yeah, Joe Johnson. Uh, Joe, Joe Johnson. Uh, I'm Johnson, Rick Richards. So. Uh, you know, like it just it doesn't. It just didn't seem. It didn't seem plausible that there'd be two guys. I mean, you know, perhaps Benny wasn't really his name. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so how did how? So you um, when the, when the kids and all came out in the early '90s, late '80s, early '90s here in America, yeah. were they bigger in Canada first? Oh, I don't see. I don't know. I don't. I, where did you live? Where did you, where were you living? Nineteen nineteen ninety. Where's Paul Myers? Okay, I was living in Toronto. Um, mm-hmm. I was uh, I definitely there for the whole time. I mean, I, I moved to America in ninety seven. So so the show okay. was off the air by ninety five. So right, Brain Candy was ninety six. I think so. So um, so yeah, I was there for the whole thing. I mean, I was there. 
when the kids in the hall, you, I don't know. Did, did you read my book? I, I can't remember, like, cause you're in it, but uh, yes, I did. No, <laughs> no, no, no. But, I've read uh, every book I'm in. <laughs> exactly. Well, everyone can read the index, but, uh, uh, but no, but, uh, so, no, but here's the point. I just recap for the listeners at home. One of the reasons I wrote this book was, I've been around, I've been comedy adjacent for most of my life and, uh, and kind of, you know, in and out of it myself, working with comedians, playing guitar with things. And, but, uh, when I was, um, starting, my brother Mike was at Second City Workshops and right. he had gone on to the touring company and he had, had such a great time learning improv comedy that I went down to the Second City Theater in Toronto and I took about two cycles, which is six weeks each of improv workshop and i was using it mainly to get good at being on stage just to be you know to be not nervous on stage right. and to be body aware and that whole thing about knowing where you know where you yeah. are in a scene and stuff like that and um i also probably secretly harbored a thought that maybe i'd be good as, as good as my brother who was even as a kid was gr- good at comedy like it was just one of those right. things where okay mike's good at this and we're all young so there's a possible chance i'm good at this you know and right uh, right 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 as embarrassing as it is to say now but uh i went and took the workshops and i was pretty you know okay but i i you know i just knew i didn't have the killer instinct to be funny while i was there i was in between classes i was in the hallway and i saw uh young dave foley and young kevin mcdonald and they they had known mike's work from the workshops and i think they'd all done like theater sports every so often and dave foley walks up to me and literally says you're Paul Myers. Uh, they say I'm like a young Mike Myers. <laughs> and, and like he was young himself, <laughs> right? And also Mike wasn't famous, so it was a funny thing to say. And then Kevin McDonald walked up to me and said, we think your brother's the best improviser we've ever seen. And uh, probably literally like that. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, no, that was a very good. He's really good. He's really good. good. I, we thought we were good, but this guy's good. And then um, and, and so I was like charmed, you know, then, tell, uh-huh. tell me more about how great my brother is. And right. then uh, I, just what I want to hear. And I was saying I was saying that I played in a band and we were playing over at this club called the Rivoli and he said oh they said we no a little later on they told us they were playing at the Rivoli that's right and then I I we heard that they were playing the same rock club that I they were doing comedy there and I was like I actually was dating a woman at the time who'd gone to university with Scott Thompson and I said oh those guys the kids in the hall that's that like she wanted to go see Scott Thompson and I said but he's in this kids in the hall with my friends. So let's go. So that's when we started going every week to see the kids in the hall, put on a brand new show every week. I was born in 1933. You're my dad's age. Yeah. No, you're my mom's age. Yeah. Well, there you go. You're my mom's age. Saw yeah. Snow White first run. Wow. 19, yeah. Well, that was 1936. You know, yeah. um, that witch scared me to death. There has never been a villain to beat that witch. Mm-hmm. My mother tells a funny story. Um, well, she has dementia now, so all her stories are funny. But uh, my mom tells a story about seeing Frankenstein with Boris Karloff, and she lived out in the in a holler in Virginia, and then went home that night, heard noon, there was a cow in her bedroom window, and it looked like Frankenstein. Oh, oh, scared, oh, scared oh, poor little kid. But, but, but I know what you mean. Yeah, but in that era... Like you're science, you're you're a, you're a science fiction fan. Mm-hmm. You both are, and, yeah. and John, you had you grew up in a different place, but the same era. Yeah. For for people that are serious science fiction fans, mm-hmm. like it's slim pickings. It uh, was then, yes. yeah. And, and and I'm trying to find the analogy to like if you were into something today. It's almost impossible to draw an analogy because everything is available. No, because now. you can go on the internet and yeah, find right. you know, anything you want. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, it always surprises me just how many organizations for a totally obscure subject there really are. Yeah, yeah. no, it's it's and, it's, it's um, it, yeah, it really is. A st- a ma- it, it's just everything is at your uh, yeah. everything is at but your fingertips. Then. In fact, m- magazines and it hasn't helped us yet. at all. No, <laughs> no, no. no. Not really. and, <laughs> well, the book truck, of course, didn't carry science fiction because in those days it was the, it was a librarian's point of view that science fiction was not literature. Yeah, and so um, you couldn't go to the library and get War of the Worlds and, or anything like and that. Most no. of the no, most wow. of the uh, most of the. Um, Magazines were available elsewhere, but not in Thousand Oaks, one little store. Uh huh. Because I lived in it when there were like maybe 1,500 people, and that had to include Lake Sherwood. Right. So, you know, and um, 
So when I finally, I, I finally was introduced to science fiction, I, by the way, had, had read Edgar Rice Burroughs' Mars series. Uh huh. But that, by the way, qualifies John as, Carter, John Carter, right. Mars, and 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 so not on. the most dashing name mm. in the history of literature. No, and not the best movie ever made either. Yeah, um, oh, Ted movies. Johnson of Venus. <laughs> That's about it. Yeah, yeah. But, the, uh, uh, yeah the his movie heart was, was in the right place. Did not hold a candle to the actual book. Yeah, no, the books are amazing. The books oh, yeah, are yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah they, all of Edgar. Yeah. I mean, he's only known as a couple things about Edgar Rice Burroughs. One, people assume that. Tarzan is named after Tarzana. The other Tarzana way around. is named yeah. after Tarzan, yeah. which is amazing. And uh, yeah, the Pelucidor books and the, those, they're oh, yeah. they're amazing. But, yeah. So then it was a long dry session where I didn't even know where to ask or ask you know what to ask for because the term science fiction did not come my way. We were in uh, Newport Beach. Well, actually, we were in Costa Mesa, which in those days was known as Goat Hill. Uh, <laughs> it was Goat and, Hill? Yeah. And we lived in, Better name, we lived in a trailer park. Mm-hmm. This was not a movable home park. This was right. a trailer park. Right. And um, uh, the trailers were so close together that you could hear everybody breathing, you know. Right. And um, I had come down with something, probably flu. I did that a lot. And... Bronchitis. I'd Bronchitis. Bet. And I, you know, you're right. And I was, you know, complaining and like teenagers do. And a woman from next door who was the wife of, <laughs> here's some name dropping for you, the Swedish angel. He was a wrestler. Tor Johnson? I don't know what his real name was. So you were Tor Johnson's neighbor? Yes. Well, this um, is a now. This is a huge part of your there you go. of your fandom <laughs> uh, cred, and you don't even flaunt it. Oh, well, Tor Johnson. <laughs> but I'm so modest. Tor Johnson was Inspector Daniel Clay in Plan Nine from Outer Space. Oh, for oh, goodness' sake! Oh my God. Well, I often wonder. If I'm a real, big boy. A real next. classic movie. Heiko gets it's it's one of my favorites. It was just Heiko gets flashlight from patrol car. Uh, the, of course, they traveled around in a trailer because they went to various wrestling right. venues. And it was just before, and I was just a teenager, Bejo, so I Bejo, didn't even understand Bejo. this, was was there was a huge wrestling um, uh, scandal on fixed wrestling. Mm-hmm. And this was the No, only, really. This is the only, <laughs> what? the only thing you could watch on TV. Uh-huh. Just about. Yeah, TV, you're sport, right. Yeah. You know, you could watch on TV, so everybody did. And, you know, we had gorgeous George. With yeah. Flaunting the curls and so on and so forth. And, but, but he was such a nice guy. And his wife came over and she said, I'm tired of hearing the kid bitch here and handed me a huge stack of astounding science fiction magazines. The pulp magazine. Yeah, yeah, sure, she sure, sure. She was a science fiction fan. And I thought, well, okay, because I read anything. When I right. ran out of something to read, I read the sides of cereal boxes, you know. Right, right. And so I um, I started reading. I had no idea what a robot was. I read Asimov's iRobot. I had no idea. Wow. No That's idea. Amazing. And I just kept reading them until finally I, you know, I, I couldn't find it in the dictionary, the little dictionary we had. Right. So, but yeah, and I could finally go to a library and ask, and they, the, I had this librarian say, you've been reading science fiction. <laughs> I might, might as well have said porn. Right. Know? And um, I finally got her to tell me what a robot was, and um, she looked it up. I was just so thrilled to get some answers, but I was so thrilled that this existed. Yeah. And to me, it was just opening major doors. Sure. And that's the great thing when you're a kid and you find your thing, you know, yeah. and, and, and it's, inex- and it's inexplicable, you know, and, you know, when I was a kid, I was you really know. into the, you know, the universal movies and, and, and Star Trek, like Star Trek was on every night at six o'clock on channel 56 <laughs> in, in Massachusetts. And I don't know why I was drawn to it. You know, I, I don't know why I like Star Trek more than Watching the Red Sox, I don't know, <laughs> but and and also like g- growing up in a very chaotic environment, uh, there was something dependable. It was there every night. Like you knew at six o'clock, you turn and it was there for you, and you could count on it. And it was really, it was really important. Um, well, and we, it, we liked the messages, you know, mm-hmm. and and it just uh, Gene Roddenberry had. Gene L. Kuhn to, to 
take the edge off of the preaching. Uh huh. Gene would push a push a sermon if he if yeah. He, but but Rod Serling, same thing. Rod Serling was the Aaron Sorkin of his day. He was he was not afraid to to run a monologue as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. If you watch Seven Days in May. There's a, there's a lot of, yeah. there's a lot yeah. of, people don't talk like that really. Um, oh, well. But his heart's in the right place. As I say, same with Gene Roddenberry. His heart was in the right, place. In the right and, place. And, and, and Star Trek, you know, Star Trek was on at the same time as Lost in Space. Lost in Space was considered, you know, like the network would have probably loved it if Star Trek was more like Lost in Space. Oh, yes. yes. And when you and watch the two, you're to. like, yeah, one is, this is not, this is actually an adult show. And it, I was watching, I was in Atlanta two weeks ago working. And I was, at, you know, tel- television has changed now. Like now the way television is streamed, you get into a show and then you watch all of that show. You know, it, it, that that's what uh, it seems to be. You know, this binge watching yeah. it totally escapes me. Yeah. Well, it's it's a whole, as somebody who's living is selling television shows, I've learned a lot about it. And I'm watching my daughter's like, my daughter's like, what are you watching? The Office. Which means that she watches all nine seasons of The Office. Yeah. And then now what are you watching? Pretty Little Liars. And she'll watch all of Pretty Little Liars or whatever show she's into. And I am in, I'm in between shows in, in my <laughs> limited time. So I was just watching Star Trek. Like to me, it's, it's like, it's like a blanket. It's just comfort food. Oh, great. Star yeah. Trek is on. I'll watch that on Netflix. And you watch the early one. I love watching the first season because you really do see these actors finding these characters that, you know, like they're the, the, the early episodes, they're, they're not all the way there yet, you know, and no. it's really, when you know it, everybody was kind yeah. of feeling their way. Yeah. It's beautiful well, to watch. Spot, the early yeah. spot shouting, you know, mm-hmm. and, and that sort of thing. Excited. And then, yeah. And then, uh, but you know why he did that? I'm sure, you know, hmm? well, I watched for the love of Spock, which I'm sure you've seen. Nope. Have you seen? Oh no, nope. that's wonderful. Oh, I get to tell you something about Star Trek. This is this is alarming. <laughs> and I told you you were Tor Johnson's neighbor. Yeah, yes. I really feel. <laughs> I really feel like this is a red letter day. There you go. Um, when Leonard Nimoy was doing the pilot with Jeffrey Hunter, Jeffrey Hunter, uh, who played uh, Captain Captain Pike. Pike, the first of many, uh, he's a very quiet internal actor. Yes. And uh, played it very quiet. So Leonard said, like, well, I wanted to play Spock very quiet. But then I'm up against Jeffrey, and he's very quiet. So we can't both be playing this internally. So I had to ratchet it up. Then when William Shatner came in with his sort of Horatio Hornblower (laughs) bravado. Swashbuckling, yes. Yeah, which was great. And that allowed him to find the, the Spock as people know it. That allowed him to play it down and allowed him to play it more subtle and 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 then people don't forget is a lot of a lot of other uh you know and directors give notes and you know do you know you know the 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 Vulcan nerve pinch was invented by Sean Penn's father Joe Penn who directed that episode and said instead of hitting him on the head with the butt of a phaser can you do something like can you do some alien and and Leonard came up with the nerve pinch the FSNP <laughs> famous Spock nerve. Yeah, yeah, right. And, and yeah. That's, that's, that's how that's we it's called right. that in the scripts. You'll FSNP. See. Yeah, yeah. And Leonard does funny. FSNP. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious! I didn't know that. I know in uh, in the Simpsons, <laughs> in the script is per- parenthetical annoyed grunt. <laughs> yeah, that's and we funny. also had a thing in the Simpsons where if you said uh, if you said hobo. We had a big run on hobos. After hobo, it would have to say in parenthetical with Bindle. <laughs> hobo with Bindle. <laughs> well, that's a hobo. It's a as hobo. As opposed to uh, just a know. bum. <laughs> yeah. One of the funniest things I ever saw, again, by George Meyer, was in the script. It was a, a slug line that said hobo. And then there's a little thing called a parenthetical, which would go after that, which is like furious, sad, whatever. So you get right, it's yeah. a hobo, parenthetical, all business. <laughs> just... 
So that's when we started going every week to see the kids in the hall put on a brand new show every week. And so we were there watching it like the Beatles in Hamburg, you know, it was like literally. And then, you know, some weeks there being few at the beginning, there weren't that many people there and we felt like part of a little club. And then some weeks it was packed because they'd gotten a good review or something. And then there was this blizzard and I talk about it in the book. There was this blizzard and it was like seriously six foot high snow drifts. The, you know, the streetcars weren't running. You couldn't get a cab. So you'd have to really walk in the snow through, you know, it was horrible. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, they're probably not even doing the show, but in those days you didn't have the internet and you didn't, I didn't have a cell. Yeah. You had to to go find out. I didn't have a phone. So I walked to the club and as I got closer, I saw that the lights were on and the windows were steaming up and everyone was inside and it was like packed. And I remember thinking, wow, the kids in the hall can pack the place during a blizzard. Things are going well. And sure enough, they were, that was, and actually Kevin told me later that that specific night was the night they realized they had built a following and that it was probably going to be solid. And it was, so that's why I opened the book there because it, to me, it's like where, you know, Uh also I felt like I had to explain why you Paul Myers, you know, your name's Myers. Mm-hmm. That's all. Is that all? Is that the only reason you get to do this? You know, you wrote a book about music. your last book was about music. So, so I, I just wanted to let everyone know that I am a comedy aficionado, if you would call it that. You know, I think that's the best oh, yeah. word for it. comedy nerd is what I probably would go with. You know. Yeah, but but it's also it's like you say it was like it was like a punk. You say in the book it was like the punk scene when you were doing it. And, yeah. You know, and, and and what you just described, it's the same thing. It's like going to see. You know, you going to see the kids in the hall in a bl- in a six foot high snowdrift blizzard in nineteen eighty something. Uh, eighty something. Let's, let's, yeah. let's say eighty eight, maybe even. Yeah. Or maybe even maybe even eighty five. Oh, well, yeah, I, I'm sure like, I could research like, it if I had a book handy. <laughs> but it's like kids going to see X at the mask in 1976 yes. yeah, here in exactly. LA. It's the same thing. Nobody knows about these guys there. They talk to me or, you know, me and my friends going to see the pixies for a dollar in Boston at uh, the paradise. Wow. That's um, cool. No, but that's the same thing. Absolutely. The same thing. Cause as they got bigger, you were like, I remember we, you know, I remember when they, they had the giveaway tickets or something. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 And, and then, and then, and so when they, they came. They came to the kids in the hall premiered in in, in America. Uh, that was all because of Lauren Michaels. Now, for those for those people who don't know, uh, tell tell the the elevator pitch on what happened, how they how they took off. Oh, well, I mean, the, yeah, the shortest version of it is that so there was like several auditions. Uh, Pam Thomas, who at the time was Dave Thomas's wife, uh, mm-hmm. she worked for Lauren as a. Uh, Lauren Michaels as a sort of a casting director and she would yes. go around and they, and she had seen them. They got a good review somewhere. So she went to see them in Toronto and she had brought up of some people. And, you know, I think I will say Pam Thomas's Pam, Pam Thomas's review of me to Lauren was, I don't know what he's doing. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. We, we became, we became great uh, yeah, friends. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I love Pam. I'm friends with Pam and Dave. Well, I it's sort of like when Mark, when Mark Marin tells that story about how Lauren Michael said to him, it's like, you know, what you're doing downtown. I don't know where you're going with that. You know, like, like <laughs> you guys <laughs> yeah. south of the Mason Dixon line, whatever you're doing, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. and um, that's, I, I don't do a Lauren really but I just did one there. Um, so, so Lauren eventually downtown. comes what you're doing downtown. Yeah. Like downtown. Like it was like, a, it's like as if he said bridge and tunnel or something, but uh, yeah, but down uh, in the village, yeah, down, down, in the village. down in the village. I've heard, I've heard noises South of Houston, you know? um, but, um, but uh, you know, the kids in the hall. So eventually got this audition and then Lauren actually, you know, went to bat for them, but then they, he said, okay, here's the thing. We got to get, you. well, actually he signed two of them as writers for SNL and they had like a fast season there um, where they, I think they had a hard time working into the, you know, Mark and Bruce had a hard time working into the show and were getting kind mm-hmm. of frustrated because they'd already had the kids in the hall and they were like, how come we're not doing that? And I think that's hard. That's hard. I've been in their shoes and that's really hard. Yeah. And they were working with George Meyer and different people. Like mm-hmm. they had like, people who turned out to be some of the people like, you know, like, uh, Smigel, yeah. I think Smigel was in the writing room at that time, probably Jim Downey. Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, I can't really Gamble and yeah. Gamble and Pross were probably there yeah, at that time. Yeah. There was just a lot of people who had their thing. And I don't think the kids in the hall style probably wasn't going over and they would do showcases in New York and people didn't quite get it. And anyway, mm-hmm. so eventually, uh, they go home, uh, Bruce and Mark, and then they, they learn, gets a second look at them as a troop and says, maybe this is what we should do. And then they get, uh, they, he brings them to New York 
for six months, uh, what they called boot camp where they played Caroline's mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, they just basically, yeah. they basically did, they, they did their, their, that, that was kind of really their Hamburg, I guess they were workshopping, yeah. playing, opening for other people, opening for stand up, which is, you know, that's interesting before, before, uh-huh. re, before Rita Rudner, the, they would come out and <laughs> they would do like sketches, like, you know, the AIDS yeah. bucket that sketch. The, yeah. That is the definition of unforgiving. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I think Lewis Black apparently was really nice to them. I, I couldn't get him for the book, but, uh, 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 he was producing, what was the show? Gotham. Oh, oh my. yeah. Live at Gotham. Yeah. No, 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 no. What was it? This is too, well, he was on the, jo- so, this is like 80. Yeah. 80, 87, maybe 88. Yeah. I yeah. wrote the book, but it's funny. I should probably brush up before I talk to people. Uh, but it, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, if you remember which year you weren't really there, um, but, uh, right. but uh, he, yeah, he was producing one of the shows that they played at regularly and he would come out and do his thing with the newspaper where, you know, the, uh, Will Rogers, yeah. just here's what I read the in the news, except it's, it's Lewis Black. So it's yeah. Not, angry, it's angry, Will yeah, angry Mort Saul. That's the, it's like angry Mort Saul. If that's not angry, too well, actually, I think angry Mort Saul has that covered, right? <laughs> or at least the lady late era Mort Saul, the one I saw at Mill Valley a few times, but, uh, yeah. um, but, uh, anyway, so they got Still good. They, 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 they cut to the chases. They got good enough to finally get an HBO pilot. Uh, and they, uh, CBC co-produced it so they could use the Canadian broadcasting like studios in Toronto, but they had some of the bankrolling coming from com from the HBO. And then, you know, so they had a, they had a chance and that's how they got on the air, you know? Uh-huh. And then, and then they really, uh, they, and then they had a huge run. And now by that time I was, uh, like living down here, living down here and I was a working comedian at the blah, blah, blah. And, and it was that thing with SNL and SCTV. It was a different incarnation of SNL, a very successful, popular one. But it was like, no, these other guys are doing something way more sophisticated. Right, and right. because it was because it was um, they did stuff in front of a live audience, but it was pre-taped. And and by that and, and by that time, you know, L- SNL was a you know to, to use a, again to go back to music. By that time, SNL was the Rolling Stones. Oh yeah. And these guys were your band. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. You they know? were they were whatever bands we were using at the time. Yeah, R E M or yeah. replacements or yeah, or even the and, even the Smiths. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. Like, uh, like because they're from Canada, we, it might seem exotic the way the Smiths seemed. You know, like yeah, and and it was and it was amazing. It was amazing um, that they really did lock in on. Like the, they're so, and I uh, this uh, this this sounds this this can be taken as a negative. I don't mean it as a negative. So of their time. Yes. No, I mean yes and no. So yes and time. no, because they were of their time. I think they also were a little not. They were not dated like to specific references. Like they didn't do. The kids in the, no, kids in the hall just, never but, did but topical that, stuff, you know. But no, the, no, no. But what I meant by that is it just. Like, boy, like I can I can watch an episode of the Kids in the Hall, and it it just feels like that era so much. Yes, I know what you mean. Now, I mean especially yeah, it's the, yeah. definitely the it's the indie rock thing. It's a time when when indie yeah. rock was still. When did that end? Was it Nirvana that, that when Nirvana went platinum, it suddenly was like indie rock was no longer the other thing? I, <laughs> like, yeah, I guess. I guess. So that would have been ninety two. Yeah, but, about ninety two. Yeah, sometime around. I mean, like sometime between ninety. I mean, it took it took a while, but you know, by ninety by ninety six, it was like that's done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. And yeah. uh, but I think you're right. It's and it's hard for the kids to understand that today. Like, but just that 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 you know, there was a time when there was such a thing as an alternative culture. I mean, it's I, right. I, I, I'm sure there is now, and it's probably on YouTube or something. I don't even know where it is.
He was born in El Paso, Texas. He attended L.A. City College, where he majored in police science. He had a keen interest in aeronautical engineering. Eventually, he became a pilot. He flew bombers in World War II. He was involved in two major air crashes, surviving them both. He was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. He left the Air Force after the war and began flying for Pan Am, where he experienced his third plane crash. The commercial jet he was piloting crashed in the Syrian desert. Despite suffering several broken ribs, he helped pull the survivors from the flaming wreckage. The FAA investigation blamed mechanical failure. He was in no way at fault. But after three plane crashes, he thought, maybe I'm done here. Who is he? A scrappy young future television producer named Gene Roddenberry. Roddenberry followed his father's footsteps into the Los Angeles Police Department. He rode a motorcycle as a traffic cop and, through a series of connections inherited from his father, he came into the orbit of LAPD Chief William H. Parker, after whom Parker Center is named. Eventually, Roddenberry became Parker's chief speechwriter. Fun fact. By all accounts, LAPD's Chief William Parker had a very idiosyncratic personality that, by today's standards, would be considered, as they say, on the spectrum. He was cold distant, and not very emotional. Character traits, Roddenberry would later say, influenced a popular character he created, made famous by actor Leonard Nimoy. But we are getting ahead of ourselves. One of Chi Parker's more curious legacies was overseeing the renovation of the LAPD's image using television shows to do so. The most obvious beneficiary of this was Dragnet. Another show was Mr. District Attorney. Roddenberry was hired as a technical advisor on the show and ended up writing for it under the pseudonym Robert Wesley. From there, he wrote scripts for shows like Highway Patrol and I Led Two Lives. He kept pitching ideas and they kept selling. Eventually, he quit the LAPD and became a TV writer. In 1958, his script for Have Gun, Will Travel won the best teleplay of 1958. Gene Roddenberry's heart was in the right place. He was hired to write a series called Riverboat that was set in 1860s Mississippi. But upon learning that the producers did not intend to have any African Americans featured in the show, he argued the point until they finally fired him. Good for you, Gene. He made a couple pilots that didn't sell the series, one of them named 33 Montgomery, was about a lawyer and starred as a character actor who worked mostly in westerns by the name of DeForest Kelly. He finally sold a show called The Lieutenant about life on a military base. The show starred Gary Lockwood, who would go on to star in 2001 A Space Odyssey. Among the actors who came through The Lieutenant, a young Nichelle Nichols, Leonard Nimoy, and Majel Barrett. Despite initially very strong ratings, The Lieutenant was not renewed for a second season. Roddenberry began work on another pilot about the crew of an airship based out of Hawaii where he was stationed during the war. The ship would have a multi-ethnic crew with a brash, Horatio Hornblower-like captain. At a certain point, he decided to write the show as science fiction, and the airship became a spaceship. He wrote a 16-page treatment, sent two copies to the Writers Guild along with $2, and registered his idea. He called it Star Trek. Space, the final frontier. He first pitched it to MGM, which loved the idea, and then passed. He then went to Desi Lu, Lucille Ball's company. Desi Lu was an amalgam of Desi, her husband, Desi Arnaz, and Lucy, herself. Desilu was a full-fledged production company, but so far had only one hit, I Love Lucy. It needed more. Head of production Oscar Katz liked Star Trek, based somewhat on its original elevator pitch of Wagon Train in Outer Space. Katz and Roddenberry prepared to pitch the show around town. One network that was very interested in Roddenberry's idea was CBS. After hearing his initial pitch, they brought him and Katz back in, sat them down in a room full of executives. 
There, they began to get peppered with technical questions. How can you get this show made? How can you do an hour-long science fiction show on a TV budget? Who would you use for the special effects? Roddenberry, thinking he was close to closing a sale at CBS, sat in this conference room for hours, downloading his ideas, sharing his opinions, his contacts, his expertise, convincing these wavering executives that Star Trek could be made, and made convincingly on a TV budget. Feeling that he and Katz had assuaged the network's fears, the two men left feeling confident of a sale. CBS passed. In fact, they never intended to pick up Star Trek. As Roddenberry and Kat soon learned, CBS had its own science fiction show in the works, Lost in Space, and they were simply using Roddenberry to help them solve their problems. For free. Actually worse, at his expense. Hooray for Hollywood! You may be homely in your neighborhood. Bum, 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 bum. Roddenberry and Katz next took the show to NBC, the other big network. At this time, the mid-60s, there were only three networks, but ABC did so poorly, the common attitude was, there are two networks and ABC. NBC bought the idea and ordered a pilot. Of the stories presented, the one they chose was called The Menagerie. Roddenberry hired a writer named D.C. Fontana as his assistant. D.C. was a very talented writer, who had penned eight episodes of The Lieutenant. Everyone assumed D.C. Fontana was a very talented guy. He wasn't. His name was Dorothy Fontana, and she was a very talented woman. But this was the mid-60s, and downplaying that fact proved advantageous in the male-dominated world of TV writing. Majel Barrett, who was Roddenberry's girlfriend at that time, was cast as number one, the ship's second-in-command. Very progressive for 1964. Nichelle Nichols was hired from doing an episode of The Lieutenant, and she recommended another guest star from the series, Leonard Nimoy, to play Mr. Spock, the emotionally lacking science officer based loosely on LAPD's William Parker. As the captain of the ship, named the USS Enterprise, actor Jeffrey Hunter played Captain Christopher Pike. Jeffrey Hunter was a lantern-jawed man's man from New Orleans, most famous for his role as Martin Pauly in the John Ford classic The Searchers, alongside John Wayne. Hunter was a very serious guy and a very serious, deeply internal actor. And this is great for some stuff, like like The Searchers, where you're playing against John Wayne and you're not going to out John Wayne, John Wayne. So you play it small. In the film The King of Kings, he played Jesus. Now, the rumor is he requested that no one on the crew speak to him or look him in the eye during the shooting, lest they break his deep internal concentration to being Jesus. In all fairness, this is a rumor. But if it is true, congratulations, Jeffrey. You completely missed the point. You got it perfectly wrong. The whole point of Jesus was that he was open to everyone. He hung out with lepers and prostitutes. He washed people's feet. If you really wanted to get into your character, you should have spent time in between takes, helping out the PAs and at craft service. One interesting aspect of Jeffrey Hunter's approach had a deep impact on another character, that of Mr. Spock. Spock was, on the page, cold, calculating, brutally intelligent, and devoid of emotion. It was Leonard Nimoy's intention to play Spock as small and quiet. But he couldn't, because Jeffrey Hunter was playing Captain Pike as small and quiet. You can't have two main characters in scenes together where they're both playing it small and quiet. So if you ever see the unaired Star Trek pilot, The Menagerie, it's on YouTube, or see the scenes from the Menagerie that are repurposed in the Star Trek original series episode, The Cage, Spock is the guy with no emotion, who for some inexplicable reason is always yelling. The pilot was shot in December of 1964. But when it was shown to test audiences, it didn't score well. It was deemed too cold, too distant, too intellectual. In other words, no fun. But a very strange thing happened. Strange. Rare. Crazy rare. They got a second chance. 
The sets were already built. The costumes were already made. So NBC said, look, fire this cast. Let's see some new story ideas. And we'll try again. For the second pilot, the Enterprise had a new captain, James T. Kirk, played by Canadian actor William Shatner. Leonard Nimoy reprised his role as Mr. Spock. Although the role of number one was eliminated, Major Barrett did return to Star Trek in a blonde wig, playing nurse Christine Chapel. Guest starring opposite Shatner in the second pilot, entitled Where No Man Has Gone Before, was the star of Roddenberry's The Lieutenant, Gary Lockwood. The episode was filmed in July of 1965. And then, nothing. And then, more nothing. Finally, in February of 1966, almost a year after the first pilot was shot, NBC told Desi Lu that they were picking up Star Trek for the fall of the 1966 season. And so would begin an adventure that would take audiences, well, maybe not where no man has gone before, but it was certainly better than Lost in Space. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. No, Will Robinson. Danger. Danger, Will Robinson. Great story if it ends there, but you know it doesn't. Star Trek, the original series, has been remastered with new special effects that manage to look both up-to-date and yet of their time. The old episodes have been buffed and shined and given a digital facelift with cleanup and new special effects that are quite brilliant, but also brilliant in the way that you can't really tell they're new. Think I'm kidding? I'm not. Pick up the DVD set and see for yourself. If you want to go on a deep dive, might I suggest the book The Making of Star Trek by Stephen Whitfield and Gene Roddenberry, or Inside Star Trek by Herb Solo and Robert Justman. The last book is super full of really great inside info and a lot of gossip. In fact, be warned, it is super axe grindy. Roddenberry comes off as a shit. Shatner comes off as a shit. Nimoy comes off as a shit. Oddly, Herb Solo and Robert Justman come off like gangbusters. Also, David Gerald's The World of Star Trek. All great deep dives. Enjoy them! Also, pick up Paul Meyer's One Dumb Guy, The Kids in the Hall, The Definitive History of the Generation Defining Sketch Group, and also Paul's Todd Rundgren, A Wizard, A True Star. Todd Rundgren in the studio. Excellent books for the comedy nerd or the music nerd in your life. And while I am talking about books, let me plug a book by a future podcast guest, Mallory O'Meara's The Lady from the Black Lagoon. The Lady from the Black Lagoon tells the story of Millicent Patrick, who was not only one of the first female animators at Disney, but also at Universal Studios, she designed the creature from the Black Lagoon. She did, but her credit was stolen from her by the jealous and insecure head of Universal Studios' makeup department, Bud, I'm Not Your Bud, Westmore. It is also the story of Mallory's investigation of Millicent's life. It's a great book, and it's a great book about writing a book. I really recommend it. The Lady from the Black Lagoon. Mallory is going to be here next month or the following. I may cut her into the live show. I may hold it back. I don't know yet. i got to record the live show. You know how that goes. Lastly, let me say a word about our Patreon feature. And I want to thank everybody who signed up. It really took off. I'm very grateful. This podcast is unique, and so is our Patreon feature. We do one episode a month. The show comes out at some point in the last week of the month. It's close to three hours long, which I hope will tide you through to the next month. And with our Patreon feature, just five bucks... Get you the title, Dana Gould Hour, Sky Cadet. For this, you get access every month to extra video, bonus audio, behind-the-scenes videos of the recording of the show, etc., etc. We wanted to make it worth your while, but not make it too burdensome, too complicated. So there we go. Go to danagould.com, click on our Patreon link, and for $5 a month, it's like I'm with you all the time, in the car, in the tub, on the toilet. It's just you and me. All the links to all of this nonsense can be found on the live appearance page or Patreon links of Danagould.com. 
Hey, are you tired of listening to this bullshit? Well, someone's at the door. So let's go. We are about to witness the takeoff of the first manned rocket to outer space. We pick up the count. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We're off to visit the planets. There are treats galore in the stars. Venus is loaded with candy. And ice cream is found upon Mars. The soda pumps isn't on Saturn. When you're thirsty, it sure hits the spot. And Jupiter's really jumping. With pop on this butter and pop. Losing hair sucks. And two out of three guys will experience hair loss by the time they're 35. Introducing Keeps, the easiest and most affordable way to keep the hair you have. These FDA-approved products used to cost so much. But now, thanks to Keeps, they're finally inexpensive and easy to get for five minutes now. And starting at just $10 a month, you'll never have to worry about hair loss again. Getting started with Keeps is so easy. Sign up. It takes less than five minutes. Just answer a few questions and snap some photos of your hair. A licensed physician will review your information online and recommend the right treatment for you. Then it's shipped right to your door every three months. Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA-approved hair loss products out there. Some of you have probably tried them before, but you've probably never gotten them for this price. Keeps is only $10 to $35 a month, but now you can get your first month free. That's a great deal for getting to keep your hair. To receive your first month of treatment for free, go to Keeps.com slash dgh that's k-e-e-p-s dot com slash d-g-h that's a free month of treatment at keeps dot com slash d-g-h keeps hair today hair tomorrow <laughs> they come from miles to enjoy our intermission Now, if you're talking about crime and you live in Los Angeles, like I do, then you have to talk about Jack Webb. Jack Webb personified the public's view of the LAPD for the better part of 30 years, first on radio and then on television, as the iconic straight-shooting Sergeant Joe Friday on Dragnet. Jack had a love affair with the city of Los Angeles, and he opened every episode with an ode to its fragile beauty. This is the city, Los Angeles, California. It's a fine place to enjoy life. There are places reserved just for kids when they're young and feel young. Places they go when they're young and feel old beginning the big search for something that often doesn't exist in the places they look for it. Huh? Want to run that last sentence by me again? Beginning the big search for something that often doesn't exist in the places they look for it. All right. You say so. Their search might end with a college degree. One thing sure, whatever they're looking for cannot be found inside a number five capsule. When they try, that's where I come in. I carry a badge. Dragnet was the first police procedural show. Every episode of CSI or Homicide, it's basically a drawn-out episode of Dragnet. At least at first, when Dragnet was on in the 50s, it was a by-the-books cops and robbers show. And then it returned in 1967, after an eight-year hiatus, to take on a new enemy that was threatening the good citizens of the City of Angels. Hippies. Jack Webb did not like hippies. They were dirty, they had long hair, and they took weird drugs. Of course, this could only end one way. He's dead. Which is not to say that Jack was a stranger to drugs. Alcohol is a drug, and Jack Webb enjoyed a cocktail. 
He not only produced Dragnet in the 60s, he directed it, and he didn't fool around. Sergeant Friday wore the same outfit in every episode because he did not want to mess with wardrobe. He had a small group of actors that he felt comfortable with, and he used them repeatedly, and he had no problem using the same actor in a different role from one week to the next. Now, the rumor is, and this is where it gets good, all of the important coverage of a scene, all the close-ups and the two shots, were all shot in the morning. They all had to be done before lunch, because sometimes, after lunch, Jack was not so productive. Sometimes Jack would have too many martinis. In fact, the crew would often hide the clock to make sure they got what they needed for the day before lunch, and sometimes one o'clock wouldn't roll around until 3.30. The afternoons after lunch were dedicated to masters, where things like Sergeant Friday walks into a room in a straight line when possible. Jack Webb went on to make a fortune as the producer of shows like Adam 12 and Emergency, but he never lost his hard-ass by-the-book image. I actually had a friend who worked for him late in his career, and he claims that for all the bluster, Jack Webb was a pretty decent guy, which is always nice to hear. And not too surprising, to be completely honest. Jack Webb, L.A.'s finest. <laughs> Struck me. Uh, all business. Yeah, a hobo <laughs> being all business. It was so contrary. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, wow. so when when Star Trek really hit its stride in the in uh, 66, 67, and, and and you're very close. You're very close to the show. You would see them yeah. film it. Did you become close with Shatner, Nimoy? Not close, like hanging out, but like uh, familiar. Like, hi, Bill. How I land? Actually, or- no, because uh, they had been advised by other actors saying, "Well, if you're going into a series, and and the fans will become so They'll eat you alive," is yeah. what the other actors yeah. told them. Mm-hmm. Eat you alive, and so try to avoid them at all costs. And they did. Uh-huh. Uh, D. D. Kelly was very, very friendly. And uh, if you m- mentioned pets, out would come the wallet and he would show you everything from his dogs to through to the turtle. Oh. And um, uh, uh, so far as I, um, he and his wife may have had children, but if so, they were up and gone. But I don't believe they did. He was such a nice guy and he was so much fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we met. Very him, shy. Really? Which is why he was a television actor, not a stage actor. Right. That could play yeah. very internal and, and, yeah, and small. And, you know, with with the um, movies, he could be a uh, uh, the ba- one of the bad guys. Yeah, he was a villain in Westerns, yes. really. And, yeah. But he said he didn't have to really do much except stand there and glower and, mm-hmm. you know, one hand on his gun. When, they, like when the series went off the air and before the movies, Gene had – he he had serious – uh, feelings that he'd ruined D's career. Uh huh. Because he was suddenly, because he'd been couldn't be cast as a villain a living, anymore. Playing second banana heavies in westerns right. and some cop shows. Right. And he couldn't get hired to do that anymore because he nobody's was, going to believe kindly Doctor McCoy, kindly, yeah. a rascal kindly right. Doctor McCoy, was going to be a heavy. Did you ever see a special called? It was called Ultimate Trek. It was in the late nineties. And it was just a clip show where Jason Alexander from Seinfeld was Kirk running around Los Angeles. And it was just introducing clips of, <laughs> yeah, it, it was called, I was McCoy. It sounds hilarious. I was McCoy. And I had to learn how to do McCoy, which is, it's all this. But, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, and I was at a, it, you know, it was a cash and it was just a clip show. Uh, and I was at a convention and Mark Altman, okay. Mark Altman walks up to me and just says, I've just now forgiven you for that Star Trek special. <laughs> I was like, Look, I, I need to eat. <laughs> like anybody else. But, and we had original series oh, uniforms. Was hilarious. And those, they were very unforgiving. Those, those, they were. Shoot, yeah. You, you really had to stay this on. This is, it. in fact, why they did, they finally did the green wraparound for Captain Kirk. Because, because every time they would have, go on hiatus or he had a couple of times when all he did was just make an appearance type of thing. Right. He would put on weight. 
Uh-huh. And the uniform didn't allow that. And so they did a wraparound so that they could fit him at any Right, and then he would work out and, yeah. Yeah, and then he'd work out. God bless him, I'm the same way. (laughs) Well, and they did that. They did that for the women. Almost all of their outfits were actually wraparounds. Mm -hmm. You know, hooray for Velcro because of of, of, um, periods. Because a lot of women bloat during that time. Oh, okay. And so, you know, you have that little one-inch... Sure. Yeah. yeah. And it's funny you watched, I was watching the original and you you look at some of the women's uniforms, they hardly look military. No. (laughs) (laughs) Well, hardly anybody's was in those days. Uh, Mainly uh, too, uh, Jean wanted um, to uh, give the women slacks and, uh, you know, bloused out for the the boots and stuff, but still uh, pants of some sort. And NBC is the one who wanted the shorts. Sure. I'm sure. Yeah. Because hello. Which is why in in Next Generation, you see some of the guys in the skorts. They were actually shorts and wraparounds again. <laughs> Except lasted two that, shows. That lasted two shows. Yeah. And here's why. First, men don't know how to bend over to pick up something like women do. Women know to kneel and you know yeah. tuck the dress under them and so on. Guys just bend over, showing a lot more talent than maybe anybody planned. Yeah, and certainly um, for syndication. Yeah, <laughs> and also, um, it in a very hot set. If anything was made of either leather or algaide, and you sat on them, mm-hmm. and your bare thighs were hot. in contact, and then you tried getting up again. There were small screams around the set, <laughs> and finally the guy said, "We aren't wearing these anymore." So yeah. that was, but <laughs> and, well, the uniforms changed between the first and second season too because they were uh, pretty, again, brutally unforgiving. They were, yeah. Well, they were kind of they were made that way yeah. because uh, nobody was supposed to gain weight, right? And uh, it's one know, way to do so, it. Yeah, I guess so. But yeah, no, te- no television acting is it's. it's yeah, it's, it's brutal in itself. It is. Yeah, having done it, it's just like, goodbye, food. You can pick your alternative culture. Oh, yes. Pick which one. They're all monetized, yeah, and they true. all have their own channel. And, uh, you know, it, it's uh, it's tricky. But, yeah, you know, every... You know, you'd, you'd have your whatever city you lived in had its cool vintage record store, bookstore, used yeah. clothing store, street, the alternative newspaper. Right, uh, right. And, you know, that's and it was just like and I still like to me, that's how I identify when I go into a if I'm working in a city, you know, on Saturday or Sunday. I like where's the where's the college district? And I, that's where I kind of go and find a coffee shop to hang out. in. it's just where I feel comfortable. No, I agree. I agree. It's uh, like um, like. Queen Street West, where the Kids in the Hall was and where I used to play, that, that was the area at the time and uh, in Toronto. And that was, you know, uh, comparable in some ways to that street in Austin. Uh, 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 Congress. That was it sixth. Um, or maybe it's Congress. Uh, the street that has all the most of the nightclubs or a lot of nightclubs are on one street. Like, uh-huh. yeah. Oh, yeah, bars. yeah, yeah. I'm thinking uh, of I think it's sixth, actually. I don't know. I, yeah. So, no, I, you know, I've only ever been to Austin. Congress is a Congress is a is, Congress is a uh, mercantile street. It's where all the group stores are. Uh, the clubs are on sixth. Yeah, that's right. OK, because I've only been there for two different. I went to two different South Bys and I haven't really been since. I actually liked Austin a lot in terms of especially in terms of Texas. Austin's great. I'm going there in a couple of weeks. Oh, good for you. Um, John Doe lives. John Doe lives in Austin now. Oh, does he? Because he used to live up mm-hmm. where I am, I think, for a while. I used to hear that. Yes, he did. Yeah, but he lived he in did. Richmond, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, I didn't know he'd moved to Austin, but it makes perfect sense. You know, yeah, a lot of people are moving to places like Austin and Nashville and stuff like that. It's- Jaw dropping expense of Northern California oh, I mean, is seeping out to Richmond. Oh, tell me about it. I mean, like I live somewhere yeah. between Berkeley and Richmond and it's uh, like we like where we are. We, we, you know, we're paying down this house. It's a small bungalow and I've got a studio in the back, you know, a right. tiny studio. There's nothing in here. Don't rob me. Um, but um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, we just have the two pit bulls. I mean, that's all we have, really. And, uh, the, and the karate school yeah. next door. That's all we have. <laughs> and the and the, uh, the karate school who, who can be mobilized at, at, at any call when I make. I just have to send the signal. Um, but uh, <laughs> but boys, we needed. Like, uh, but uh, <laughs> um, it's a very old. It's a very old racist caricature. Of 
combination. Man. I didn't do the voice. I exit voice were needed. It was. I didn't. Do, I deliberately didn't do an Asian voice. No, it's a giant. It's an old. It's an old caricature. Giant buck teeth. Oh, oh yeah. The the the, uh, but the logo. The, the screwball. No, it's the, the logo scroll. of the karate school. Actually, that's right. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And it's run by a guy who has in no way connection to Asia at all. Like he's yeah. just like, yeah. It was. It was this or a flower shop. He just thought, oh, let's open a karate school. Sure, why not? My wife and I had a dream. Um, but oh, we digress. Um, so so yeah. So that thing about the kids in the hall and how it ties in. I'm trying to find my way yeah. home here. Um, yeah. So yeah. No, it's, so watching it's, it's, watching it's, them it develop and evolve was interesting for me too because you know parallel my brother had had his run so there's a great scene in the book where mike gets finally gets his audition for saturday night live and he's at uh i think i, I think in the book i said it was the brill building but i i since realized it was probably at 30 rock but they were at the elevators right. and you know they were visiting the kids were visiting lauren and they were at the elevators and then mike was going to see lauren as they were leaving and it was like kind of amazing it's like mr dr livingston i presume you know it was like yeah 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 these, these and like what were the like just even if i'm not involved in the story i would think that's amazing that would be like uh the rolling stones rock and roll circus or something you know where yeah, john lennon like jamming with mick jagger were, you know like, right people at their peak people just prior to their like meeting on the way i love scenes like that I mean, yeah I, i've written music books and uh i wrote one about long john baldry and one of the things i loved about long john baldry besides the fact that nobody seemed to know who he was until i wrote this book uh he you know he was a contemporary of uh stones he kind of helped them name themselves and he discovered rod stewart and put him in his band and he put elton john in his band and this guy just happened to be in this circle where like dave davies of the kinks you know hung out with him one night and talks about it and and just all these people and they, just the idea that they would go around the club and they would see uh a young justin hayward of the moody blues or you know, and just I just stuff like that blows my mind. Yeah. You know, like like a yeah. salon. when you're in a when you're in a when you're in a scene. Yeah, like the Algonquin Round Table. You know that whole effect. Yeah. You know, I just and I, I think there was a little bit of that. Um, the kids in the hall kind of created their own sort of situation in Toronto. There was uh, there was a great troupe called Corky and the Juice Pigs with the great Sean Cullen, who is still yeah, to this. Yeah, Corky and the yeah, Juice Pigs. and Sean Cullen's still one of my favorite funny people he's a wonderful comedian and he was very influential to a lot of us and so he'd already done the rivoli and dan redican had the frantics and they were sort of on the radio and and dan later worked for the kids in the hall for a while and uh that but that was pretty much it and then the kids in the hall kind of you know second city had owned comedy and then theater sports but in terms of like hip troops you know nobody really knew there really weren't any rock troops uh, until the kids in the right, hall. And then, right. and then the vacant lot got prominent after that, which is Nick McKinney, Mark McKinney's brother and Paul Greenberg, who's to this day, right. Paul Greenberg actually does a podcast with Dave Foley. Uh, they were guests on this podcast last month. Oh, well, there you go. Well, Paul Greenberg comes from that scene and I'm sure they would have been yeah. doing their own comedy anyway, but because of the kids in the hall, Lauren, you know, had interest in that scene and, you know, there everyone comes around looking for the next version of that, you know, and the vacant lot ended up getting a, on TV as a result, you know, and, and there's a lot of cool things that happen like that because of the kids in the hall. They kind of turned it into a little bit like Seattle, I guess, or maybe when all those Liverpool bands got signed in England, Yeah, you know, and, and that was neat to watch. That was neat to watch. Uh, it never quite became like Chicago is, I think, but there definitely, there was a, you know, sister feeling of, uh, we we could understand the whole second city Chicago thing because Toronto for a long time was the second city in Canada because Montreal before the language laws Montreal was actually the center of Canada and then you know and then now we have different you know now I'm just getting into the dumb civic talk yeah but uh, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> No, yeah, well, it's it, it is, but it's indicative of, of it's actually what's happening up there is indicative to uh, entertainment that everything now is sectioned off, and yeah, there's, yeah. you know, you know, what are, what are you? I'm into vam, you know, vampire metal. Are, you go down that hallway, third door on your left. Yeah, you know, what that's are you right. Into? That's right. Uh, psychedelia. Okay, fourth door on the left. You know, everything. There's a. It's all preset. For everybody yeah that's true it's true and i i i can only imagine i like to have faith that um revolutions and you know or shake-ups do this they just come when they come you know like uh, you can't yeah it you know the, it's like one of those things like um you can't sort of know what's around the corner and if you look at um 
the mistake that a lot of people make when they make historical uh, TV shows and films is that they, they assume that everyone in 1977 was already into punk rock or just got into it or 76 yeah. and that, you know, yeah. and that, the, and that every, and that every car is a brand new car from 1977. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, everything is brand new. Yeah, no, it's true. And, and yeah. I thought about that too, because I never adopted the look of punk. Like I, I loved punk when it came out, but I never, mm-hmm. I never uh, started wearing a, you know, a safety pin. And, yeah. uh, I never had, yeah, no, you know, I, yeah, yeah. couldn't afford a leather you jacket. Can like the mu- <laughs> yeah. You can like the music and you didn't have to look like you were, uh, you know, going to the rock against racism to see the class. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, having said that, I did play a rock against racism benefit, but, uh, you know, um, I was actually, I remember once getting played, asked to play, um, something for the African national Congress in support of, uh, you know, smashing apartheid. But I was the guy who said, okay, so my band plays this thing for free. Who's the money going to? And they said, it's going to the <laughs> ANC man. And I go, okay, so who at the ANC is receiving it and what are they doing with it? And they, and they said, well, we're just going to collect it, man. Do you want to play or not? And I said, well, I guess I don't then. Cause I feel like, I don't know if you guys are affiliated with the ANC and this feels a little weird. And like, I was that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine how cool I was. No, I mean, I, I, that's anal retentive Paul. Yeah, go talk to him. I guess that's how we were raised. I admire your career and that basically your your career is you just get to do <laughs> these deep dives into things that you love and are fascinated well, by. And like when you do like when you do the kids in the hall book, do you are you now sick to death of the kids in the hall? Like if they come on TV you're like, "Oh god, I get, get me out of the room." Well, uh, you know, does it come at a price? You know, it's funny. You know, when I start Obviously you love the people. Yeah, no, no, exactly. And I remember when I started this, I remember uh, the kids in the hall book, I remember going around to each of the guys. I wrote the, I wrote them a group email that said, you know, I just want you to know I I, I would want to do this thing out of respect for you and I, you know, having known you and I want to make sure that there's this definitive book that really covers it and I want it to be your story. I'm going to be the guy telling it, but I want it to be your story. I want you all to, you know, and then Dave Foley, all he said was, uh, was it by the end of this process, I'm pretty sure you're going to hate us. Like, and, and, and that's so Dave, by the way, but, uh, and, <laughs> yeah. and I actually said to him recently, I said, I'm just about ready to hate you. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, the, but the, I mean, I, I didn't, I mean, I don't. And the, but here's the thing, what happens with all of these things and it happened with the Todd Rundgren book is you get wary of being known as the guy who like, I, 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 As that guy. I, yeah, yeah, I'm a, no, I, I'm a nerd yeah. for these guys. I'm a nerd for the kids in the hall. I'm a nerd for Todd Rundgren. I'm a nerd for the group XTC. I love the group XTC. Like I, I, mm-hmm. I've loved the group XTC since the beginning and I'm, I'm a fanatic and I cherish the fact that I have, you know, email communications with Andy Partridge all the time. And like, we're, we're buddies and like, you know, wow, I know, I know. I mean, just, just to think about that, you know, just for me to think uh, sitting there dissecting those records when they came out. And then anyway, so my point is this, I am now, you know, I'm pals with Todd Rundgren. I can email him if I want. And at the same time, I'm really, I don't just approach him for anything. And, sure. And, no, I'm, yeah. I mean, I, I, this is a minor now, but like, I'm completely weirded out that I'm friends with the kids in the hall. Yeah. You told me that. And that, that, that see, that's, that sort of blows like, my I'm, mind. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Foley's been in my house. Like Kevin, you know, it's like Kevin McDonald is my, is my, Beatles ephemera email buddy. Oh yeah. He's, know, it's a good, you, you, pick, you picked well, like he's good. Yeah. Like, Kevin's and, great for that. I, yeah. I love, him. yeah. And you know, it's like, I know Foley and I know, and I know all these guys and, and McKinney. And it's, to me, it's, it's bizarre. Yeah. And yeah. I've known them for, I've known them for, you know, a long, long time now, but it's still like, Holy shit. Dave Foley was at my house today. That's insane. I, I always get this weird feeling and this sounds like name dropping. Maybe it is. Uh, Robin Hitchcock will sometimes like my photographs on Instagram. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, 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 I yeah, John Doe liked a couple yeah, of things. And it's just like, I was like, like holy but, goddamn shit, I, John Doe. I never would have predicted that Robin Hitchcock would even know my name, you know, like that's, yeah, you know, and I, maybe he doesn't, I, maybe he just knows pull my ears because uh, that's my uh, online handle. Right. You know? But, right. uh, but anyway, um, no, I totally get back it. to this totally thing about being it. sick of people. The one thing that, um, I guess it's crop rotation. Uh, so I got known in the Todd Rungard world is this guy and people would go to me. So, uh, you know, they'd make a reference to a lyric and then they'd say, I can't believe you didn't get that, man. That's from utopia. I'm like, Oh, right. It's from the, it's from what album? Like, <laughs> cause I don't right. remember. Okay. So that, that, yeah. now, now as we, as we turn the corner, give us for the listeners of the Dana Gould, our podcast that may not 
be versed in 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 like they know the name Todd Rundgren, but they don't know okay. why okay, he's yeah. important. So this is uh, how he's important. Flexing my also yeah. probably the the if if one if I had to if an alien came down and said what was wh- you know what was uh, what was 1972 like. I would show him the midnight special performance of Hello, It's Me. <laughs> With Todd Rundgren wearing, like, uh, peacock eye makeup. A peacock yeah, eye makeup. And, and yeah, feathers. It was and, this. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. No, it's true. I, uh, uh, so so here's, the, here's the pitch on the book, okay, if that's what you wanted. Like, yeah. yeah. Is that what you yeah, want? Yeah, just like, and for people who don't know who <laughs> okay, Rundgren is. Okay, so Todd Rundgren is, it has two, car- he's a, two... He's a, yeah. a gadfly, but yeah, he, he's more important two, than that. He has two parallel careers, so... Todd Rundgren is super well known for being um, a song song a writer and guitar player from the seventies. He sort of made his name with "Hello, It's Me" and "I Saw the Light." These big records and the album "Something Anything" mm-hmm. and uh, the album "Hermit of Mick Hollow," and and then people know him from that. But parallel right. career was he produced bad fingers baby blue it, like that album straight up and he produced uh right. we're an american band for grand funk which is like one of the most iconic rock songs in american history and he also mm-hmm. produced like he worked with uh, the band on stage fright like he basically engineered it like they didn't really have a producer but he ran the show and then uh he did um meatloaf's bad out of hell was his like he bankrolled that and produced it and, I didn't know yeah. that. I did not know And that. he produced Patti Smith's, uh, the Patti Smith Group's fourth album, Wave. He, he produced XTC's album, Skylarking. He produced the Psychedelic Furs album that has Love My Way on it. Um, mm-hmm. He produced... Uh, Sky, Skylarking, by the way, can, certainly the breakthrough album of XTC, arguably their finest album. I, I think so, too. I mean, it's sort of... Yeah. You have that thing among XTC fans where it's sort of like uh, the way Beatle fans argue about Revolver versus... Uh, um, versus uh uh rubber, rubber soul, soul. Or, yeah like which yeah. one is the one where they broke away and i'd say skylarking is definitely uh such a great leap up for them i mean i mean you could say that drums and wires was a breakthrough album because for me it was you know but um right. but yeah and then and then i think oranges and lemons is the one that was kind of commercially broadly accepted that you was, know yeah that was their giant mayor simpleton smash. the one they did in la you know mm-hmm. I, apparently right. compl- they've had some bad experiences and that was one of them apparently they they enjoyed working with the producer on uh on uh oranges and lemons but they hated being in la you know because they, they're just completely it's antith- antithetical to them i mean yeah by the way if you ask them today they might have changed with time their opinion of it so but that's right. the thing about uh, long lives and careers is, you know, they might remember a bad thing within the group, but they might not remember it badly anymore, you know. But anyway, mm-hmm. Todd produced Skylarking, which uh, sw- talk about fraught. Um, so Todd goes into this as this, you know, I think he'd admit he was cocky and he was asked by the record company to whip this band into shape. And they had a reputation for dragging out their making of their records. And Andy Partridge, on the other hand, comes into this also cocky because he was considered one of the great pop songwriters of his time and all the albums prior mm-hmm. to this had been made with largely his will, you know? And, yeah. and so, and, and by the way, that wasn't a random appellation. He's good. No, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's a well-deserved reputation. Oh, no, I that just he's bringing to the table. Parenthetically, yeah. by the way, but as long as we're talking to STC, um, somebody, you know, people always ask me to do these, um, there's these sort of indie compilations of covers and somebody's doing XTC. And I said to them, can I do, uh, can I do one? And they, well, they invited me and I, I said, can I do Rook, which is an odd song for a guy like me to be doing, but it's, it's a song from, uh, uh, Nonsuch. And it's a very, um, it's a very mournful song about dealing with mortality. And I uh-huh. just recorded a version of it that won't come out for a while, but doing the vocal and having to get inside the Andy Partridge melody, I just had a whole new level of respect for his craftsmanship. It's like Burt Backrack level stuff. It's it's sure. It's just like you know, yeah. rook, rook, da, 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 who murders, da, 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 da. it's like melody goes all. It's like a great show tune. And here's little Paul Myers who writes his own songs trying to do it. <laughs> and I had to do like thirty takes. You know, um, right? But I you know I think I got something. But it, it was uh, it was one of the things where I actually said to my wife, I said, "Oh my god, I had no idea it was this good." Like so that and no, I understand yeah, that completely. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. Like, wow, this is this is this is actually uh, it, it's 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 beautiful when you see it on the showroom, and it's beautiful when you when you're under the hood. Well, I, I, 
I had this conversation with my brother, Mike, uh, and, you know, he, like yourself, he's a comedy professional and we were talking about Python and, and, you know, sometimes we talk about how certain things don't hold up that you loved when you were a kid, but we were talking about mm-hmm. a particular Python sketch. I wish I could remember which one. And we both just went, Oh my God, it's so tight. The parrot sketch yeah. is brutally tight. It is. You can't, yeah. there's no air in it. Yeah, exactly. And you, you assume <clears throat> that they tried variations before they got to, or maybe they just lucked out. I mean, it's hard to say, but it, it's certainly, it's a great example of um, having five, you know, arguably six people in the room, because um, <laughs> I yeah. think of Terry as off doing his cartoons, but uh, Gill- Gilliam, <laughs> Gilliam, I mean. But uh, yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, I digress to bring you back to Partridge, and um, and so yeah. So when they work, when Andy works with Todd, boy, I did it. Uh, when Andy works with Todd Rundgren, it's it's sparks are flying. They're they have to do it at this barn up in Woodstock, New York, uh, Bearsville. Uh, it's actually Lake Hill, New York, where Hermit of McHollow was recorded. And, uh, and that's where that's where Rundgren lives and where his studio was. He lived at the time, yeah. He he uh, right, he yeah. he bought the. Oh my God! Some incredible stories came out of this book, uh, the Todd book, because I didn't know this, but the guy who uh, I'm not going to say the guy's name, but we know who I mean. The guy who shot John Lennon, killed John Lennon. That guy right. had a list of people he wanted to possibly also kill or kill instead. Yes, and, and Rundgren yeah. was on it, and he had a copy of uh, one of his albums in the house and in, in the apartment, along with uh, uh-huh. uh, Catcher in the Rye. So, so <laughs> you're in good company wow. there, uh, Lennon, Salinger, God. and, and uh, Rundgren, <laughs> uh, and also Todd. Uh, when they lived up in uh, the Catskills, there um, they had a home invasion. Somebody thought he had tons of cocaine in in the house, which it, I believe him when he says he didn't. And the, but these uh-huh. guys tied up everybody and they pistol whipped to his housekeeper. And it was like, it, I didn't know any of this stuff. And then that one of the reasons he left, um, I think the Woodstock area is he moved to, uh, Sausalito. He came out to live in Sausalito for a few years and he was here in the late, uh, I guess it was the late eighties. You're tight with Star Trek. You're friends with Roddenberry. We were on the set a lot. We were on the set a lot, we seeing a lot of uh, episodes being yeah. filmed, which is amazing to me. Yeah, yeah, you couldn't get away with that now, but you could yeah. then. Yeah, that's amazing to me. Anything in particular, like, uh, well, the key that tipped us to doing the campaign was Deadly Years. Mm-hmm. We were we'd seen several episodes being filmed. Right. Parts of them, yeah. And for the people who don't, Deadly Years is where they all get that disease that makes them old. Yeah. Right. And Shatner did a very brave thing. He took off his toupee. Mm-hmm. And that was, um, yeah. And that was something that was, you know, so. Is that, is, so is the hair in, is, is what he is in that episode when he's old, was that what his hair was really? Yeah, or pretty much. Yeah. Uh-huh. They enhanced it a little bit. But, oh, okay. Uh, I, you never know how, you know. And it's so, so and I, I don't know, maybe it's me. I'm really good at spotting toupees. Yeah. Like, why is it got oh. a toupee? Why is it got a toupee? <laughs> and there's some people, you're like, like Shatner. Shatner. And Connery, too. It's just like, dude. You would never know yeah. until. But Shatner paid a hell of a lot of money for those toupees. Yeah. And believe me, they were the finest you could buy. Yeah. Yeah, no, and, and I always wondered if it was a uh, if it was a comment to Shatner that he hired Patrick Stewart to be the captain. So, I'm not doing, <laughs> no, it looked not like he went like, bald when he was eleven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it wasn't. He uh, uh, they uh, uh, that was a whole thing entirely. Actors don't have a lot to say about meet hires on, hire ons for other shows, but. Uh-huh. No, I mean, if it was Roddenberry, it's like, oh, oh. look, Bill. Mm, well, maybe so. Yeah, that, that could have happened. Yeah. But um, so, that, so it was the deadly years. Yeah. So we'd seen previous episodes being filmed, and it was a very uh, friendly, even among the ones that didn't like each other, uh, set. Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody was having a good time doing it. Right. And they didn't come- like each other. They'd come down off of, <laughs> off of doing a scene, and they'd sit down in their chairs, and they were joking back and forth. And it was, it was a very up sort of thing. Atmosphere was totally different on Deadly Years. It was. And we watched. <laughs> it's wonderful. Uh, I've got this indelibly etched in my mind. 
Shatner has come back to the bridge. He's been made young again. Right. And uh, Dr. McCoy's magic elixir has done its job. Right. He jumps down off of the upper level of the thing, down onto mm-hmm. the command chair level, and then grabs his back like there's still a twinge. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we watched Shatner get to do that almost a dozen times. We don't know whether the director wasn't happy with it or whether he was having Shatner on. <laughs> I'll go for that one. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, Bill jumps up and down this thing, and everybody come down, and there was just this totally different atmosphere. Everybody's very down. And it just start asking around, like, yeah. why? And mm-hmm. people didn't want to talk about it. So we did what you do when you want to find out what's really going on on a set. You go over and talk to craft services. Right, yeah. Because they they'll know. Yeah. <laughs> For the craft services where there's the snack table. Yeah. Coffee yeah. pot and all that stuff. And they yeah. know all the gossip. They know everything, just, yeah. yeah. And, and, and they, yeah. Guy said, you know, uh, he says, well, the words come down unofficial as yet, but the show's going to be canceled after this season. And we thought that we were really, uh, damn. So... And we finally get a show we like of science yeah, fiction. Yeah, and there's show, nothing and, else. Yeah, it's just, so we nothing lived else on. We lived in Oakland at the time, so we're oh, driving okay. back up the Central Valley before interstates. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's a long trip. Yes, yeah, so you're not on the. There's no five yet. No, no. no not yet. And uh, so, when was the five put in? Early seventies. Yeah, I have no idea. late seventies. Late seventies. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. So I didn't know that. We're driving back up. Then routes. Uh, 966, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> we're talking wow. about this, you know. And we both do enough about the industry to know that uh, if a show didn't have three seasons in those days, it wouldn't go into syndication. Right. And if it didn't go into syndication, it went off the air, it was dead. Right. Nobody would ever see it again. Put it in cans and put it in archives. Right. You know, until later. So you, you know, knew then yeah. it was all about syndication. Yeah. 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 Wow. So we So uh, you really did save Star Trek. Yeah. We Well, we had help. We're talking mm-hmm. yeah, but with each other going, you know, and I'm I said to her, <laughs> you know, I should know better. <laughs> <laughs> we hadn't been married for very long at that time, but yeah. <laughs> I said, "Damn, it's really sad that that show's going to be canceled. There ought to be something we could do about that." Uh-huh. And I said, yeah. So we spent the rest of the trip working on formulation of what we could do. Right. Now, of all of the uh, save whatever shows that have been going on now, kind of worked from our blueprint because nobody else had done it. Not that we knew of. Right. So we we were working completely in the dark about how to proceed from here. So we, we talked about it for a while, and we got home, and I said to John, we need to phone Gene. If he has thrown in the towel, there's no sense in running a campaign, right? Right. So we called Gene. And he was not over, he was not as involved in season three as he was in season two no, anyway. No, that, well, no, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah. There isn't a season three yet, so it's still no, season two. No. Right. So, so <clears throat> we get on the, on the phone with Gene, and he says... Now, just to, I want this is 1967, mm-hmm. and we're talking about Star Trek. Yeah, just to put it in context, the number one show on television mm-hmm. is Gomer Pyle. Yeah, 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 yep, yeah. Okay, <laughs> and you're trying to save Star Trek. <laughs> well, right. So Gomer Pyle didn't need saving at that go, time. No, it was Gene, Gomer Pyle and Gene I Dream of Genie. I think were the two biggest shows on television. That he had just come from a staff meeting where he had said. If there was only some way we could reach the fans to tell them the show is going to be canceled, and mm-hmm. we fell in his lap. Now, maybe that was true. Maybe it was just Gene shining right. us on. Who knows? Yeah. G- Gene told a good story. Uh-huh. You know, so. That was his job. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and so <clears throat> then I went around to offices, and I would say to people, the secretaries and personal assistants, what letter, what kind of letter – makes you just throw it away or Smart. put it in the nut file or answer it yourself or put it across your boss's desk. Mm-hmm. 
and they gave me the information. And I put it all and together. And what kind of letter? What kind of letter makes the cut? Uh, first, non-aggressive. Has, <laughs> yeah. First, it has to be in a business envelope. Okay. It should not be written in perfume purple ink on uh, mm. pur- on uh, on right. yellow, you know, paper. yellow paper. Yeah. Uh, it should be as business like as possible. It should be no more than two paragraphs. And basically, uh, please save the show. Don't go into a polemic about how much you love Mr. Spock. Right. Just, you know, and no, make no threats. Uh, do do, do no tirades. Sound Business, like, sound, yeah. you know, go to, and, and if you do have access to a legitimate uh, business uh, letterhead, no matter what, use it. Right. And so <clears throat> the business the, people only respond to business. That's yeah. right. And the thing about the the, the uh, business envelopes is that NBC actually had to hire extra people to come in and open the letters because they couldn't be certain which ones were business right. and which were weren't. Yeah, you had to open them. So they had to pay extra people to open the envelopes and read them. And unfortunately, they threw away all the envelopes with all the return addresses on them. We oh. could have used those. But um, after we formulated that and we, we, for the letters themselves, you write 10 letters. You write, you write a letter. Write a letter to, uh, pardon me. Copy yes. this information, mm-hmm. all this thing about right. what sort of things to do. Send it out to 10 of your friends. Ask each of them to write a letter and copy the information and send it out to 10 of their friends. Mm-hmm. Now, and that worked. Well, here's the trick. Don't just write to the network. That's that, you know, they can ignore you. Write to all of the sponsors. Mm-hmm. These sponsors are paying for time. Right. Some of them don't even know what they're, what the show is. They don't care. Yeah. Uh, and all of a sudden they're getting letters from people saying, we're sorry that you are no longer going to be supporting this show. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, so and so. And the network was getting irate phone calls from sponsors. That's amazing. And why are we getting these letters from these people? What are you doing? You know, um, and basically it came down to should I be sending you any more money? And boom. So and, you know, again, to the to the sponsors, you don't make any threats. If you don't ever plan to buy a Ford, never say, well, you know, <laughs> just say I, I you're, you you put out a fine product um, and and yada, yada, yada. And I'm right. sorry, yeah, yeah. Yeah. you know, sorry, you're not. It's business. Show. We did not also write a model letter. Mm-hmm. We said, make up your own letter. You have to do that. Because even in those days, they knew how to... Um, Double check and see if that was yeah, you know, so just like everybody Xerox basically mm, yeah. yeah because um, there were uh, a lot of it was a lot of it was religious uh, uh, people who would write in uh, letters like this and and it would all be the same letter right and they'd recognize that so, sure yeah and um, we got the mailing list from the convention that Gene had appeared at. Um, which again, you couldn't do that anymore. And from a, a lovely uh, um, man named Big Hearted Howard DeVore, uh, who owned a, um, a, a mail order, mail uh, order book uh, store, uh-huh. and he sent his um, list. And then we, you know, we told him, email, I mean, email, mail to everybody. This is before uh, we anybody had home computers except the very wealthy. So we, yeah, 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 this do that. decades. And uh, then, we asked Gene about fan some mail. of Star Trek's fan mail. Mm-hmm. Gene says, I assume we're getting some. I've never seen it. Nobody had known to go check in the, in the Paramount mail office. So and- we, we went to the, <laughs> over to the, to the mail office. It's just tons. And tons. they said, good. We got all these sacks of mail back here. <laughs> I thought it was really great to be able to talk about Todd as a producer. And then here's the, here's the magic ingredient. So you got him as an artist. So I'm going to talk about him making his records. I'm going to get him on record. And by the way, he, he said yes right away when I pitched his management. 
they said, oh yeah, Todd thinks it's a good idea. Sure. And I said, well, he's going to, he's going to need to participate in a lot of interviews. <laughs> Can, right. I'm going to probably need to come out. He lives in Hawaii now, by the way. So don't, don't, don't. Must be yeah, nice. Yeah. What a hard gig. I'm, I, Paul, you're going to have to go to Hawaii to interview him. I mean, I don't know. Can you do that? Um, but uh, it gets better actually. So I, I, I messaged his management. They said, Todd said yes immediately. And, and then I said, well, I got to, I got to phone him talk to him for five minutes just to, just to make sure he understands a, that I'm going to do this with a lot of respect. And, and then that B that he knows how much he's getting into, cause I'm about to sign the book deal and I want to make sure. And he, so he got on the phone right. kind of reluctantly, you know, Todd talks like this sometimes, you know, okay. Yeah, great. Yeah. sounds good. Sure. Let's do it. I said, but you know, you know, I'm going to need to come out in Hawaii. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Set it up. Come on. You can stay at our house. And they have a guest house. They have a guest house. <laughs> so I f- book my flight to Hawaii, and I think I'm going to rent a car when I get there, and I'll go find his house. Do you, do, do you don't have to be any more specific than this. What island? Uh, 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 Kauai. Kauai. Uh, so, you know, it's Paul. That's the Garden Island. It is the Garden Island. <laughs> I feel like you're going to tell me the volcano is angry today. <laughs> like, like the, vo- uh, the volcano. That's the main island. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's no, no, no. This, this is all the rocket. lush. They just get whipped by but the. Kauai. They get whipped by uh, about tropical storms, though. That's yeah. the, and that's why it's so lush. And it, isn't that where Ben Stiller? It's the guard. It's yes. It's where Ben did uh, tropical. Yeah, because it's so much like right. Vietnam. I agreed to do it, and they were going to put me up in this guest house where the, the last guests had been the New York Dolls, who had done their their uh, sort of reunion album with Todd in the, in the uh, period uh, it was a 20. So there's a lot of lipstick. Yeah. A lot of stuff. Actually a lot of receipts yeah. from David Johansson's fish. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of receipts <laughs> from the strand bookstore in New York. I remember finding, finding <laughs> literally finding New York uh, receipts everywhere. I don't know. Oh, that's I guess funny. they kept them, but then dropped them. But anyway, my point is I get, get to the airport and Lahui, depending on how you pronounce it. I'm not sure. Yeah. I, that's how they pronounce it, but I, I, I don't know. Yeah, Louis. Louis, been yeah, there. And so been so there. it's a little tiny airport, and I get there, and I'm thinking, I'm just going to get my bag, and then I'm going to message them and figure out how to get there. And they and they said they were going to send someone to pick me up, which is cool. I, I thought, that's cool enough. I go there, and then Todd Rundgren walks over to me, and he's like, he's like uh, do you have any more bags, or are you ready to go? And I'm like, oh, wow, nice of you to come out with, with the driver, I'm assuming. And we go out, and he's in a pickup truck. And he's driving me back. And so suddenly, this this is so weird to remember this, but I'm driving in Hawaii, having just flown in there from San Francisco, and I'm in the passenger seat in Todd Rundgren's pickup with him driving and me just sort of, at, he asks how my flight was. And I'm like, I'd met him a f- couple of times before, but like, this was kind of, like, you want to, you sort of want to write a letter to the 15, 16 year old inside you and say, yeah, yeah, guess yeah, what yeah, happens? Yeah, totally, guess what totally. happens, Paul? This, it gets, and it gets weirder because he drops me at this house. Um, that's a really nice house off a golf course. Uh, I should say a disabused golf course because I think there'd been the management problems of the golf course. So it was all yellow. But, um, but then, you know, I get the whole run of this house and there's all this Todd fan art because I guess they kept everything that people sent him. So there's these paintings of Todd Rundgren and homemade, uh, mosaics and, and then he says, you know, he's going to, he, he, uh, he says he's, you know, gonna take me to the, the, the real house that he lives in so we can start, right? So we put my bag in and everything like that. And then he's, there's a car in the driveway and he says, and here's the keys to that car. You can use it while you're here. So I don't even have to rent a car. <laughs> and so, and then he drives me over to this pagoda style house that he's built further down the island. And it's a beautiful with an open, um, it's a, like an open living room. Like it's, a, it's got outdoor furniture and it's got partially uh-huh. covered, but one wall is just open and it opens on a beautiful lush mountain with chicken. By the way, this is, this is starting to sound like the movie ex machina. <laughs> <laughs> Does he then ask you to interview a hot robot? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, and I, you know, actually it's funny cause I, I usually, this is the point where I usually get into David Byrne because I start to say like, and I think, how did I get here? This yeah. is not my beautiful house. That, I've, I have been in that. I have been in that situation. Yeah, no, it's just it's so weird. And that, like, and, you know, we do the interviews, and and um, you know, and I, oh, and I set up a microphone, a little stereo microphone to do it. And Todd moved the microphone a little bit, and I thought, oh my god, he's producing me. Like, it was like, like he's moving, he's moving <laughs> the mics. And it was like, and then, and then he wants to break at like I think it was like five o'clock or something. He wanted to break for a minute so that he could watch a uh, uh, comedy show. I think it was Will Ferrell. Uh, uh, an Adam McKay's thing about George W. Bush, you know, the 
Uh, because uh-huh. I believe that was on at the time. And then maybe Bill Maher at the time. I think he was, it was something else. So he, he always stopped to do comedy shows on HBO, like just to watch comedy shows. And That's so funny. It was just, it was just, anyway, so, so I thought, how cool is it that I get to talk to him about, about all these things? And he, he was pretty, pretty open about talking about everything about his career and everything about, you know, he wanted to talk, he would look up things online while he's talking to me, like, uh, this microphone, it was called a, Sennheiser. Oh yeah, it was the U fifty two, whatever. Like, and I just made that up, by the way. Nerds at home, I that's not a real right. thing. <laughs> don't go don't looking, go looking for, it. for it. Um, order it from B and H. Um, but uh, <laughs> but um, but uh, uh, but then the other aspect to my book was that I would get the other people, so I would get to talk to XTC on the, I, those were phone interviews because they're in England. But um, I also talked to Patty Smith in person in in. Uh, um, in, in this little cafe in, in Greenwich village that she goes to. And it, it just like that alone blows my mind. And she get, she was going to give me like 25 minutes. Uh, I only asked for like 25 minutes and she said, you know, sure. Come on over. We'll, we'll meet in a coffee shop. And we start talking and, you know, I'm really nervous to the point where she has to tell me to calm the fuck down, which is like, it's <laughs> so your worst fear. Right. Like, and, but she kind of was maternal yeah. in a weird way. It was like, you're freaking me out. She said, I'm like, Oh my God, I'll never forget it. Like, like I hear it in my head, but then I took a breath. She gave me a chance to take a breath and I did. And I, I was like, <sighs> you know, that thing where like, if you blow this, it's uh-huh. like you're on live TV. And we said, well, we can't take them all. Cause we got a Volkswagen. Right. <laughs> So, um, you know, we'll take some. Wow. And we took them over and told Gene, you need to have somebody go pick it up. And uh, so we opened the mail bags and simply took down addresses. We didn't even open the mail. That's a ginormous job, though. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then, of course. That's the, a huge job. The Postal Service. Now, we were going to uh, mail, bundled mail uh, our, um uh, this on by bulk mail, right? But it's also important to know like, you guys are a married couple. Do you have kids at this point? We have yeah. two children. You have two, two children. You're, you have you have jobs. I'm assuming you're you're not I do. He me. Does. I work at home. Yeah, you had um, uh, you were a what? I was an outside salesman selling string. Selling string, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you're both you're both working. You're supporting yeah. a family. This is all free time. Mm. Yes. Yeah. 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 And and our kids <laughs> learned to uh, to help collate letters before their little noses could clear the table. Really, yeah. yeah and, they're reaching um, up. And- now, how, when you're a string salesman, do you just drive around looking for people holding a kite? And, <laughs> I, I can help you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a good one. <laughs> okay, yeah. No, we were guy was, in the dock with just a pole. I think was, I can help you. <laughs> a cordage company. We sold rope and twine and uh-huh. all kinds of stuff like that. Sure. And I was fortunate in that part way through all of this the big macrame craze hit and we started importing this stuff by container loads from the far east okay yeah but yeah they sold by boxcar loads and so on (laughs) although i yes i did have people sort of think my husband stood on the street corner and measured (laughs) which is why i love to say instead of a cordage company i sell string uh-huh. Yeah, cause she, yeah, yeah, it got that yeah. red. <laughs> but I love so, the idea of a kite. That's yeah. that, is, that is very funny. Yeah, but you're just yeah, you're 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 a married couple with jobs yeah. and children, and yeah. and this is sounds like a full time job it on was, top of and, it. And yeah. and just with about the children. and expensive stamps envelopes, oh, not exactly. Cheap. Well, this is why we're going for bulk mail, which was cheaper, right? Uh-huh. Except then they threw another curve this time at John. I had to go down to the post office and learn how to do zip sort because zip codes had just come the in. The news oh. that was brand new. Zip code. Who are they? Okay. So we had boxes all over our living room, which oh, was fortunately no. a large old house. And each one had a zip code in it. And we would just throw mail into it until we got right. the bags emptied and so on. And then we had <clears throat> literally legions of fans coming over. This is sort of where Star Trek fandom began because, right. you know, it didn't Now, this is the Bay Area this. in 1967. No, by this time... It's the summer of love. We had know. moved... Yeah, oh, we, you know. we had been in the Bay Area during the summer of love. Mm-hmm. That's quite an experience in and of itself. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, <clears throat> you could get high on the secondhand pot smoke if yeah. you were in the right place. Right. Uh, <laughs> well, that's still true in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, now uh, you can't. It's just you just see billionaires. Um, but by this time, we had moved back to L.A. Okay. And uh, so we're in this big old house in L.A. And uh, we had we had a basement. Mm-hmm. And uh, the mimeograph, as a matter of fact, it is an old basement. house for L.A. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were doing... You know, yeah, and it's a full time, and you don't know if it's going to work. No. no, and and of course we were getting no feedback naturally. Yeah, <clears throat> there was no way to get feedback because again, since we did not have a social media set up, right? There was, you know, uh, so we're thro- we're doing all of this blind, uh-huh. and um, uh, we and we also had to tell Gene. Now he's a producer, which does mean he was a control control freak. Yeah, and. You're talking to one. Yeah, well, then you know. Yeah, but, then, but then that's perfectly normal for this kind of person. Yeah, you can't and we do said, the job. You can't. Crazy. You can't play through. You can't be part of this. He did send Wanda Kendall, who was a remarkably. She looked more lady. like Wonder Woman <laughs> than Linda Carter did. Wow. Yeah. And so he sent her back with a whole bunch of uh, Grok Spock and and uh, bumper stickers and flyers to New York. To invade NBC. Okay, this is the story that I wanted to tell. So the word comes down, they're still filming the second season or airing the second season. And and suddenly, how did you find out that this actually worked? They uh, came on voiceover. You didn't hear it ahead of time? No. no. We were watching Star Trek and suddenly toward at the end of the show, this voiceover comes on and says... Uh, Star Trek has been renewed for a third season. Please stop writing us letters. Really? <laughs> they really said that. Was it the bumper stickers that and, did it? And, you and, think? and no, it's the letters. Believe me. And but here was the funny thing. Then about uh, two thousand fans turned around and wrote them very polite thank you letters in business envelopes. Right. So they still uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. they still had to open the stuff. <laughs> I love I love that part. Yeah. But um, uh, yeah. So it all of a sudden. It it had come true, and it was like, and we, while we were sitting there looking at each other, the f- I had to open his stuff. <laughs> I love I love mm. that part, yeah. but um, uh, yeah. So it all of a sudden, it it had come true, and it was like, and we, while we were sitting there looking at each other, the phone started ringing off the mm-hmm. wall. We couldn't, you know, we couldn't. Uh, and again, this is before cell phones, and. Um, you know, we'd we'd hang up the phone and, and it would start yep. ringing, and from everywhere. Have you seen TV? Had did you? You know, and yep. yeah, you know, we wanted to put a sign out somewhere. Yes, we saw the show. Wow! But yeah, so it was an amazing. And your number then it was like Briarcliff two three six. <laughs> 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 but um, the uh, it was really uh, it was really an amazing thing to have happen. Yeah. And um, it was actually Dunkirk something or other <laughs> <laughs> close enough for government work. And so, yeah, we just uh, uh, we were just stunned. And at this point in the game, too, uh, several things were happening earlier. We had noticed that our oldest daughter was not doing well at much of anything. Mm-hmm. And um, we couldn't get a diagnosis. We kept going to doctors, going to doctors going to charlatans, you know, whatever. We right. didn't really care. We just, and in those days, in was it was the very first start to, of the uh, people suing a doctor for giving them bad news. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For giving them bad news or for a... For giving them bad news. Oh. A woman with cancer. You can't do that. <laughs> claimed that the doctor made her feel so despondent that she was suicidal and she sued him and won. And so doctors did not want to say, we're very sorry, your child is retarded. And they kept saying, oh, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, maybe we dragged that poor kid to doctors. I finally insisted on How old was she at this point? Well, our first discovery ever was just... About four. About four, Mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, you know, and she was born in 1964. And... um, As was I. Where are you? Oh, and so, and we, we... you know, it, anyway, so we have this extra pressure of, of trying to deal with the child that we don't know what's wrong with her, mm-hmm. so we don't know how to deal with it. Right. And um, and then conversely, Laura, who was um, younger, but a very, very bright kid. And um, uh, so um, uh, 
between and then John lost his job. He ended up on the entirely the wrong side of a huge uh, schism from the Chicago office, and mm-hmm. they flew out and basically fired him. Yay! So well, he now, allowed me to resign. Right, right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So, so the world, it's just one of those cycles where everything it's exactly. everything bad's going to happen. Yeah, it's now. all it's all coming in. He's like, right. what? yeah. What else can I have? And so. Um, um, it Fall just, in bits, you know. Yeah, yeah, I've had, yeah, it's like, okay, what else you got? Let's have it. It really, you yeah, know. yeah. And but. and so, uh, uh, frankly, Star Trek was at this point kind of a, a mental anchor. Mm-hmm. It was something that we knew we had accomplished, mm-hmm. knew that that w- it was happening now and everything, and and basically was be- our only bright spot there for right. A while. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and. Um, and your thing, you know, yeah. we've talked. I've talked about this a lot. Whatever your thing is, it's yeah. really important. Yeah, it's really, really important. You can't yeah. put that down. Yeah, you got to no. have it. You know, and I yeah. talk to people who, you know, that are my age, and like, you know, it's like whether it was Star Trek or monster movies or Dark Shadows or, you know, like everybody yeah, wants sure. a thing yeah. that you just, you know, for an hour a day, you kind of go live in another place. Yeah. You, and exactly. it's, it's important. Yeah. It's well, you important. know, it's like, it's to like feel you belong to something. Cosplay. One of the things that it was okay to do for a long time would be, I don't care what size you were. If you wanted to be Wonder Woman, or even what gender you were, if you wanted to be Wonder Woman, by God, you could wear a Wonder Woman costume. Right. And lately, the little, the little rule makers have come in, and now you you know body types have to be. Right. It's like, and I jumped all over someone at a comic con a couple of years ago for making fun of a woman in a superhero costume. Mm-hmm. Who, yes, uh, there was a bit more of her than. Oh no, there was a bunch more of well, her than that. <laughs> But, but but so what? She was, a, but she had an excellent costume, mm-hmm. beautiful sewing skills, and she looked like she really no. I somebody. I I, I have told the story. I was at Comic Con. This was in the nineties, at the height of Xena Warrior Princess, and there was a, a a couple coming by, and they were both big, and it was like Xena and Hercules, but it was like Xena and Hercules reflected in water. Hmm. And I started to make a wise crack, and I was with my friend Matt Weinhold, who's uh, the host of the very excellent podcast Monster Party. And Matt went and jumped, and he goes, "No," <laughs> because, <laughs> because they are. This is the highlight of their year. They they are here. They are in costume. They are so. They are with their people. They are so happy. <laughs> and I was like, Absolutely. you. And I was like, and like one of those yeah. things. on like when you. It was one of those things. Like when you go to get your glasses and you get the right prescription. Like yeah. better, worse, better, worse, better, worse. It was like. It was like click. I went, oh, yeah, no, I get it. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was like well, God you bless. Know, one of these things. You know, you have to say <clears throat> to somebody. You know, uh, I mean, are you mean all the time or just? To people in Wonder Woman costumes. You know? oh, so that, yeah, that would have worked as well. And and um, and yeah, or, or uh, you know, like, oh. <laughs> well, I and, and I used to go, and then you would, but then you would also see these just drop dead, gorgeous oh. women in these costumes, and I was always like. I'm a nerd. I go to comic book stores all the time. I've never seen a woman who looks like this walking around the comic book store. What the hell? I'm missing out. And then. And, you know, I would never mm-hmm. even approach them. I just assume they have a rape whistle under their tongue. A hello. Yeah. So years go by and I go back to Comic-Con and, and now I'm married. I'm with my daughter and we're walking around and, and we're in line at a, to get a soda or whatever. And there's this just stunning woman in line dressed as Silk Spectre from Watchmen. Now, clearly I'm a married guy. I'm my kid. I'm not trying to be creepy. I go, can I, can I ask you a question? Are you a giant Alan Moore fan? Is this, did you make this costume? And she went like, no, I'm a model. They pay me to walk around. I don't even know what I'm wearing. And I was like, of course you are <laughs> I was like, running out into the uh, hall, like Charlton Heston at the end of Soylent Green. They're fake. The hot nerd chicks are fake. <laughs> And then Todd drops me at the thing, and we hang out, and we do that thing. And then I go to meet Patty Smith, and then I go to meet um, – I, I, I did some phone interviews with some people, but, like, a few people were in person. And uh, Oh, I interviewed Lenny Kay from the Patty Smith group. 
sure. And that yeah. was great. Sitting in his little uh, St. Mark's Place uh, apartment. That I think he had another place out of town, but he kept the apartment in, in down in the village, you know, or down in uh, St. Mark's Place. And uh, just just that feeling of uh, just that feeling of I think after the Patty Smith one, I, I wrote a blog entry where I talked about walking out after that interview in the cobblestone streets of Greenwich Village because they keep some of the streets sort of. The, yeah, right. and I was like, I thought these are the same cobblestones, probably that Bob Dylan walked along, and this is where this is where it all happened, and that feeling of the continuum of like your touch. That's I guess I am a historian yep. ultimately because I I kind of love uh-huh. I love the idea of sort of time traveling through telling the narrative, you know. It, it, I I I am the same exact way, and I also love undisturbed spaces. Oh yeah. That like this is this is the building and you know it's it's like uh my friend uh, my friend Taylor White is uh uh has a lot of art exhibits yeah and he had this strange art exhibit in a mausoleum <laughs> in in Pasadena or in uh, Altadena oh yeah or wherever no Pasadena not Altadena. But it's this old mausoleum that's been around since you know, the twenties or something. Wow! And you know, people and it, it, you know, it hasn't been renovated. It's a mausoleum, right? But you go into the men's room, and it's like, yeah, this is the men's room they built in the twenties, right? And yeah. everything's smaller because uh, people were smaller because <laughs> they didn't have the nutrition that we have. That's now. right. That's and. Right. And, you know, and it's just like, but it's like, yeah, this is the toilet door somebody opened in 1936. Yeah, exactly. It's the same door. You know, it's walking, um, walking with history. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And like, yeah, you almost want to like uh, have a seance in that bathroom. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. It's very, very, you know, I, I get that feeling all the time. I, 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 it's really. No, it's true. It's I'm, true. I mean, I, I had, a, sorry to interrupt, but uh, the, so the book about Long John Baldry took me to, um, uh, Soho, London, and so I'm walking around, uh, you know, Carnaby Street and uh, you know Oxford Street and all those places, and you know I'm there uh, where the old uh, uh, the Wardour Street with the Marquee Club used to be, and and, sure. and uh, you just know the history of these places, and you know they're telling he's you know I'm reading uh, Baldry was dead by the way, so I already had to, I had these interviews that uh, were um, done by somebody else that they let me have for the book. And he's talking about these places on, on Wardour street where he used to busk and talking about how John Anderson of yes, used to sweep up at the, at the marquee club and sleep on the banquettes at night. And you're like, Oh my God, it's just like, it's all there. And, and just to walk down those same streets, it's pretty intense. It's, it's, you know, I have the same feeling in LA sometimes. And I also have the same feeling in parts of it's hard in LA because we tear everything down after 20 years. That's true. That's apart from his solo work in utopia, it's people. It's like he has three careers. He has an amazing solo career. He also created like a giant rock band that was very successful. Yeah, that's true. And he's a producer on his own. Yeah. Um, does he does he have albums like? Was like I really like that one. Boy, did I miss the boat on that one. Yeah, I don't think he ever speaks like that. But he he definitely he knows that some things worked well. Like something, anything worked well. Hermit of Ink Hollow worked well. And they all, he also is aware when albums connected with people. Like, I think he used the term that I'd never heard anyone use. And now I hear it all the time, which is, it was nice when I was rel- that that album made me relevant again. Like he would say it like, uh-huh. so you never think of people thinking in terms of their own relevance. I mean, I would, cause that's me, but, um, but yeah. like, so he, you know, when he has an album that gets into some mainstream notice, he's like, you know, being part of the mainstream culture again. And that feeling of, Oh, people are checking in on me now. It's sort of like, you know, when you, you have a hit movie or something and, you know, suddenly people care about you again or, you know, it's, you know, and then, and then he will speak about other albums that didn't connect, but he, he's not the kind of guy who's going to say that was a failure because, or that he, he loves all his children equally, I think. But there are albums sure. where he knows that they were kind of compromised. Like, I think some of the albums were, um, there was one that, uh, the ever popular tortured artist effect, all a bunch of good, right. a bunch of good recordings, but I don't think it was done as one album. I think it was kind of put together as a, as a way of packaging it like as an album. And I think it, I mean, they weren't like right. old records, but it was a bunch of recordings that had sort of 
one-off feeling to them. Yeah, it was almost like an odds and sods. Yeah, it was like that. In fact, you know, God bless Pete Townsend for being open about that on the Who's Odds and Sods. But uh, right, <laughs> uh, but you know, and, and that's so. I don't think Todd has a favorite record. I mean, you know, and it would change probably from year to year too. So sure, yeah, yeah. And did it, it lastly? Uh, you know, so. Andy Partridge said <laughs> that, you know, Rundgren, if you give him a box of equipment, he can build you a computer overnight. Yeah. But he's not, he doesn't really know how to talk to people. Well, is that your experience or is that Andy being Andy? Uh, and this was him and this was him on the Rundgren podcast. Oh yeah. So here's, here's, uh, Rundgren Radio. here's the, yeah. And you know, as kind of a loyalty to both of them in a sense, but also a loyalty to neither of them for that reason, I would say that Todd would probably be the first to admit that he didn't have people skills to be kind or, but he would consider that to be just wasting time to be like uh, uh-huh. uh, coddling people. Right. And he's made right. people cry. Um, on the other hand, Andy's right that, Todd was sarcastic with him. Todd's way of dealing with him probably ventured into the realm of psychological warfare. I, I, uh-huh. One story I particularly remember was, I think Andy tells the story about him saying, I'm going to leave you guys down here to work it out your way. And when you guys realize that it's wrong and you want to do it my way again, give me a call. I'll just be up at the house, you know, and, <laughs> and you know, one of Ben Stiller's best characters. Uh, but uh, like, you can just imagine Ben playing that. Right. Uh, but, yeah. uh, but uh, you know, and at the same time, you know, I also yeah. understand Todd's POV was that the record company said this, this English act, this English act has to, um, they have to, finally sell through in america so we've hired an american producer so we're trusting right. you to, to bring them home bring bring the sound home and ironically right. they make one of the most british albums that xcc ever made this because because yeah. todd as it turns out is a huge anglophile you know right. the naz and everything he 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 yeah. wanted to like so earn enough for us is practically the beatles you know like it's, it's yes it is or absolutely. the who at least you know yeah, absolutely you know and it, and they definitely got the kink side going on you know uh mm-hmm. i feel like uh, grass could have been a ray davies song it was like like it could you know, have, and yeah. also call call There's it a lot of waterloo sunset and grass. oh yeah exactly that's a good call a uh, Waterloo Sunsets. Oh, now we can talk about the Kinks. Okay, another time, another time. You'll yeah. have me on just to talk about the Kinks. Uh, but sure. uh, well, we'll talk about how English Rose by the Jam is a terrible failed attempt at doing Waterloo Sunset by the Kinks. Oh yeah, and they should have just stuck to covering <laughs> David Watts, right? Like, cause that's, <laughs> yes, exactly. We should be like David Watts. And, uh, the, do what you do. I bad. do a pretty good Paul Weller in my nightclub act. You do do. Uh, a good... <laughs> can you imagine? I think it would go something like this. <laughs> no. I was in London. This is years ago. 2000 something and uh it's me and my my wife and her sister and her sister's husband and we're in this little chip shop in london in january january 2001 and paul weller walks in with his daughter wearing the john lennon alpaca coat kind oh, of yeah, thing. right right and i'm the only person in our group that knows who he is and I'm losing my mind. I'm like, that's Paul Weller. Yeah, yeah. Like, huh? <laughs> Paul Weller from the gym and the Thrill Council. Who? Yeah, right. <laughs> like, nothing. And I'm like, trying to sing. I'm trying to sing uh, "Town Called Malice." Like, no, <laughs> that's that's hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like because you want to. And yeah. I would be. Yeah, he's not somebody you would want to meet because he looks like he could go, Will oh, you show your my hand? What have I ever done? <laughs> Nothing, I'm sorry. Uh, a friend of mine was on some, it worked for a TV show, and they saw Paul Weller in New York. And uh, they said, I work on this particular show, you know, it was one of the late night shows. And and he's and, and he said to Paul Weller, you know, I'm a big fan of the jam. And he goes, he just looks up from his drink and goes, get me on the bloody show then. Like that's all he said. <laughs> just get me on the bloody show. <laughs> like he didn't want to, he didn't want to hear anything else. But like, so if, you know, if you work for you know this show. I just I don't want to incriminate the yeah. person who told me the story. But uh, sure. but it was just like they were so crestfallen because it was like you know, <laughs> like and it, dick, maybe yeah. maybe also you learn a lesson about not mentioning the show you work at. You know, but I mean. You know, yeah. it's like, how about just, how about just big fan? That sort of happened to me with <laughs> they might be giants. Actually. I remember when I was, uh, I saw on the, I think it was the second run of the flood tour. Like they did flood. they went yeah. through once. And then they, the second time they came back and, and, uh, I was talking to John Flansburg and I think it was the first time I ever met him. And I said, I said, Oh my God, I'm such a big fan. I've been following you guys for years. And I said, uh, 
I don't know where. So maybe the only time I've ever done this, I said, uh, my brother, by the way, is Mike Myers, and he's a huge fan, too. And he goes, well, we've never been on Saturday Night Live. And I said, oh, yeah, okay. Well, anyway. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, and exactly. actually, the, the conversation got even weirder because I think at one point I said something about, he said. Yeah, he doesn't book the show. He's just yeah, exactly. <laughs> And then uh, it's like, if you really loved me, you'd get me on SNL. Um, but yeah. uh, and then uh, the conversation turned weird, too, because at one point we were talking about cats. And I said something about I admitted that I sometimes don't change all the cat litter. and just take the clumps out, which is a stupid thing to admit to someone. I, I'll, agree, I'll grant you. And he says, I don't know how it comes up in well, conversation. I don't know how it comes up. But either. I'm certainly guilty. Uh, I would of think that, that I, I think that as cool as I might sound to you, Dana, I'm actually pretty panicked socially sometimes. And I come up with these, <laughs> these reaches to get the conversation moving away from why mm-hmm. they're not on SNL. Maybe. I don't know. Um, yeah. Sometimes I will take a dump in the cat litter just to freak <laughs> out the cat. Just like, have you seen that other big cat around? <laughs> or you're an alpha male. And you just like totally <laughs> want to show them how it's done. <laughs> this is how you take a dump. <laughs> Fluffy, <laughs> or do you need to lick yourself, Fluffy? <laughs> it's like I showed this little kitten who's boss. Yeah, yeah. It's like no, he I think go to pee on your own house to market. <laughs> like, yeah. Anyway, 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 anyway. People who listen to this podcast, a lot of comedy nerds listen to this podcast, and uh, and if you're a music nerd as well, these are two books on my bookshelf. Highly recommend. I really appreciate that coming uh, from you, Paul Myers, one dumb guy, the kids in the hall, colon one dumb guy, yes. and a wizard, a wizard, a, a, a true wizard, star, a, a wizard, a true star, Todd Rundgren in the studio. Todd Rundgren in the studio, which is a, a, a focusing on one part of a multifaceted career. It's pretty amazing. I love goats. Sure, well, there's nothing wrong with goats. On the podcast, reach for the sky. David Goldbaum. We barely try. This has been the Dana Gould Hour, brought to you by the Internet. Music by Andy Paley, with Jake Posner behind the board. Produced by Jeff Fox. Graphic design and web production by Spencer Hunt and Segan Friend. Sound editing and post-production by Jalinda Palmer and Joe Napolitano. Hey, if you like the show, why don't you drop us a line at show at danagould.com. Tom Kenny speaking. I'm a person, I'm a person, I'm a singer, I'm a singer, I love to sing, and DJ, boom, peace out, peace out, you want me, peace out, boom.